This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Okay, good evening. Um, Governor's Baker, March 12th, order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law allows us to hold this virtual town council meeting. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I am calling the February 22nd, 2021 meeting of the Amherst Town Council to order at 632. Later on, we will call the meeting of the library trustees to order, but not at this time. I'm going to call on each counselor by name. And at that time, please unmute and say present. That way we know we, we can hear you and you can hear us. I'm going to begin with Shalini Balmelm. Present. Alyssa Brewer. Alyssa Brewer. I see your name. New headphones, they're not working. Present. Thank you. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Darcy DeMont. Here. Lynn Griesmer is present. Mandy Jo Haneke. Present. Dorothy Pam. Present. Evan Ross. Present. George Ryan. Present. Kathy Shane. Here. Steve Schreiber. Here. Andy Steinberg. Here. Sarah Schwartz. Present. Okay. Thank you. This meeting includes audio, video, and is available live on Amherst Media. It is also being recorded. There is no chat room for this meeting. And for those of you that are in the meeting, if you have technical issues, please let me or Athena know. We are showing on the screen at this time how you can connect to the meeting, either by Zoom or by phone. And um, if technical difficulties arise as a result of utilizing remote participation, uh, we will address that situation and we will note it in the minutes. Lindsay McConnell will take minutes for the council meeting and Athena will be managing Zoom screen sharing and tech su support. Athena will continue to uh, accord the, record the official votes of the council and post them in accordance with the council rules. I want to pause for a moment and take the screen down, please. And with President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris, take a moment of silence to honor those we have lost to COVID, now over half a million people. Thank you. At this time, I'm going to ask the library trustees if they would, I'd like to ask everybody to mute, but also ask the library trustees and the other guests that are with them, that if you could just let us go on with the very, very few beginnings of our meeting and actually take your video down. Don't, don't disconnect, please don't disconnect. <laughs> just thank you so much, we appreciate that. Um, I want to make sure uh, that the counselors and the public know that we have a very lengthy agenda to tonight with several important items on them. I want to alert you that in advance, I will be keeping close watch on the clock and may at some point defer items to future council agendas. We have a couple of announcements, the two that I want to make particularly sure people are aware of and an opportunity for the public to talk with us about the Jones Library options. The first is on Wednesday, March 3rd, 2021 at six. The second is on March 6th at 
on 221 at two o'clock. The uh, link to the presentation tonight, as well as all of the reports and so forth, will be available and are available in tonight's packet and will be available on the website in reference to those meetings. So you can take the announcements down, please. I'd like a show of hands from the 52 people in our audience as to who would like to make public comment. Are there any other hands at this time? Okay, then I'm going to ask that you please be respectful of our agenda, but also we'd like to hear from you. So when you make public comment, you express your views for up to three minutes and based on the number of people who wish to speak at this point, I'm seeing five. The council will not engage in dialogue or comment on a matter raised during general public comment. So I'm going to ask that we bring Marsha Muhike into the room and allow her to speak. Hi everyone, my name is Marcy Mulkey and I am an Amherst resident with two children ages three and five. I was on the fence about the library renovation and expansion project until I was able to attend a library tour before COVID hit. Now there is no doubt in my mind that we need to renovate and expand. Here are a few quick anecdotes to illustrate. First, as a young parent who is relatively new to town, I often visited the library on especially cold and short winter days with my young child. It was a wonderful, warm place to play and read and run into and make friends. While the library's metaphorical warmth doesn't hinge on the renovation and expansion, the physical warmth does. The library is an energy hog and the renovation and expansion would make the building much more efficient and reduce energy bills despite being a much larger space. It would also get the building off fossil fuels and make it net zero ready. Yes, please. Second, I love the children's room activities. They are great. What isn't so great is when your potty training three-year-old says she needs to pee in the one bathroom near the children's room isn't available. This leads to a very stressful, confusing and panicked run around two carpeted floors and at least one staircase at the library in search of other bathrooms. I can only imagine navigating the bathroom, navigating to the bathroom if I didn't speak English or had mobility challenges. Let's make our library accessible and welcoming to all. Third, the public programs are just wonderful. The bubble show and a classical music event were two standouts I attended. Fortunately, I didn't have to stand out in the hallway and try to watch and listen because I know these great programs fill up quickly and I get there early. Others left because there wasn't space. Let's renovate and build a library to meet the needs of our community. Fourth, I love the bright glass ceilinged part of the library. It's absolutely beautiful, especially in winter. And I was super bummed to learn that it leaks and leaks and leaks and leaks. What I thought was an asset to our library turns out to be a huge liability. Finally, I spent as little time in the basement as possible, so I hadn't seen the teen area until the library tour. I was dismayed. It is dark and gloomy and sketchy, not a place I want to send my kids as they get older. Let's make our library a safe, welcoming, and pleasant place for teens. In fact, let's make our library an accessible, safe, and welcoming place for everyone. Let's make the Jones the living room for the whole community that it could and should be. Let's invest in a wonderfully, beautifully renovated, functional and sustainable library rather, rather than spending the same amount of money on ineffectual Band-Aid fixes. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. I do wanna remind people there is going to be an opportunity for everyone to comment during our public forums on the library. Lauren Mills, Please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Yes. Um, my name is Lauren Mills. I live in South Amherst and in South Amherst. And I am commenting on and look forward to the town manager's discussion of the racial equity account and 
answer to how the town will transfer money to communities of color for economic and racial justice, just as has been the question of what will be put in place to address alternative services to support community upliftment, stability, inclusion into larger town affairs. There are many important efforts that educational institutions such as the Amherst College has taken to acknowledge and expand understanding of systemic racism and how it continues to affect um, communities of color and their livelihood. If, um, sorry, um, I congratulate the town for unanimous, unanimously um, approving a resolution to confront and rectify Amherst's his, historical and structural racism as that uh, sorry, as that um, continues to unfold with research from the R R four. Can you still hear me? Yes. Okay. Reparations for Amherst um, Council members. I think that the uh, request, the recent request from the R four A to town, should only go to Amherst members of color. Um, our historians and college faculty that live and work in Amherst. I think it needs to be clear to black and other residents of color who are who are making up the R for a committee group before money is given. And I know how much volunteer work goes into this work. And that's why it needs to be supported financially from the town. I think of uh, reparations in two ways, monetarily and the ongoing work of repair and healing that needs to take place. I think that this type of work is um, sustained by um, a term called blood memory, making things right for those who come before us and those who will come after us. When I think of my uh, blood family ancestors, um, and those who I've actually met. I know I have my grandmother um, who was from Texas um, and she came um, to Massachusetts and lived in Boston where I grew up. And on my father's side, my grandmother and her twin sister came from Maryland and then passed away um, in North Carolina. So um, there are only a few um, ancestors that I actually have met. So we are building a legacy on um, the collective memory of our grandmothers and our grandfathers. And we want to find a reparative solution that will enhance the lives of all of us in our communities and in our beloved families. Thank you. Lauren, thank you for your comments. Michelle Miller. The room, state your name and where you live. Hi, I'm Michelle Miller in North Amherst, and I'm the co-chair of Reparations for Amherst. I'm here to speak about a request we made to Town Manager Bockelman on January 25th. We thank Town Manager Bockelman for agreeing to the first part of our request and continuing the legal research related to the creation of a fund dedicated to reparations. This is an excellent step, step forward for Amherst's path to repair. We ask Town Manager Bockelman to agree to allocate $5,000 for our work, specifically so we can compensate Black community stakeholders and leaders who are supporting us in the repair process. This year, the budget includes, and I quote, the addition of $80,000 to engage the community as we explore, identify, and implement strategies to confront systemic racism. On December 7th, the town resolved to engaging in a path of remedy for Black Amherst residents who have been injured or harmed by discrimination and racial injustice. It's time to activate that commitment. We are confident that the allocation of $5,000 toward the work of R4A will meaningfully advance reparations in Amherst. 
We appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Michelle, thank you for your comments. Peter Blood, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, I'm Peter Blood. I live on Jenk Street in Amherst. I'm also the co-convener of the Interfaith Opportunities Network, which is an association of about 20 faith congregations, most of whom are in Amherst. And uh, the ones who aren't, like my uh, congregation, have lots of members in Amherst. Um, all of our congregations in, in ION are deeply exercised about the issue about systemic racism and are doing a deep dive to look at the issue. Um, and particularly, we're looking very deeply at the issues of reparations and are deeply grateful that Amherst is considering some uh, approach, perhaps similar to what Evanston has done. There's a, a saying that says you should think globally, but act locally. Reparations are a wonderful opportunity for us to um, take on an issue on a national level, but also on a local level. And Amherst could be only the second uh, community, I believe, in the country to implement this on a local level. To do this fairly and adequately, we really need to engage our African-American residents. I want to second the proposal from Michelle a moment ago that you consider reconsider giving the idea of financial support, both to bring in resource people from Evanston to work with African-American residents to understand more fully what this possibility could be, and also to in involve uh, members of the uh, people of color in Amherst in the process of research and uh, investigating how this could move forward. Uh, many people I know who are people of color don't have the freedom to do this kind of work in their spare time. They may have children, they may have jobs. And uh, providing a, a modest amount of financial support, like $5,000, would go a long ways towards make, uh, moving this step forward. Um, I hope that you'll consider uh, the possibilities of how we can get a more inclusive room than we have facing you. I, I, I like all of you, some of you are my friends, but I think I see all white faces in front of me. So this kind of step of using money to help people to be able to afford to spend time doing research and work on these issues, I think could go a long ways towards broadening our participation in these issues. Thank you. Peter, thank you for your comments. Tony Cunningham, please enter the room and state your name and where you live. Hello, I'm Tony Cunningham, Owen Drive. Uh, in the information on the Jones that will be presented tonight, um, the information on the cost of the repair alternative is inaccurate. It appears to use different assumptions than those applied to the expansion, including different principles and interest rates. As a result of this inconsistency, the repair is presented as costing more than the expansion. How is it possible that a $36.3 million project will cost the town less than a $14.4 million repair? I would like to see these charts updated using the same assumptions so that it can be an apples to apples comparison. There's a strong sense of deja vu here. The package being presented this evening advocates for only one option, namely the expansion and renovation. And I was struck by the unwillingness of the trustees and their fundraising team in their responses to the questions to support a repair option in any way. While I felt for a long time that this plan was based on an overinflated service population and the program cascaded from that number, that is what water under the bridge at this point. Going forward, I think energy would be better put into seeking areas for compromise. While some people may be opposed to this project on historic preservation grounds or objections to demolishing the ADA compliant 1993 edition, personally, I'm more concerned about the cost and what it would mean for other town needs, both capital and operating. I continue to be skeptical of the figures to date, and I haven't yet heard a good explanation of how an estimate based on construction starting two years ago has not gone up in cost at all. I'm also skeptical of the promised fundraising campaign, and I worry about committing the endowment to cover any shortfalls until fundraising goals can be met. I think I recall reading that much of the $273,000 bequest was already spent on redesigns and studies. So it'd be interesting to know how much of the quoted raised funds are still in hand and can be handed over to the town. Lastly, I take issue with the trustees counting CPA funds as part of the, as if it were an outside grant. It's my understanding that CPA funds in Amherst come directly from Amherst taxpayers, not from the state. Why then are the trustees permitted to apply for those funds and count them toward their fundraising rather than reducing it 
using it to reduce the burden to taxpayers in a, um, to 14.8 million. If the numbers being presented are accurate and using the endowment as collateral to bridge fundraising gaps will not jeopardize the ability to properly operate the Jones and the two branch libraries at the levels they were pre-pandemic, then it would make sense to me to move forward. But there are a lot of ifs and unknowns and the risk is significant as the impact of further burden to the town would affect not only the other capital projects, but the operating budgets of all town departments. As it is, we see that moving forward with the four projects will necessitate severe cuts to all department operating budgets, which will mean job losses in our schools, libraries, public works facilities, and IT departments. Thank you. Tony, thank you for your comments. Isabel Ramirez, please. Please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, uh, good evening. My name is Isabel Ramirez. I am from Guanajuato, located in Central Mexico. I have been living in Amherst for the past five years with my husband, who is a PhD student at UMass, and our children. I would like to talk to you about my experience in the ESL program that the Jones Library offers. The program has been one of the main supports that has helped me integrate into the Amherst community. I can still remember the frustration I felt when I first came to live here. I couldn't speak much English and I couldn't even ask where the bus stop was. Uh, the ESL program is a unique and invaluable resource that give us the push and the tools that we need. The ESL program helps develop trust and a feeling of connection with the community. Uh, the library offers one-on-one -on -one tutoring, conversation circles, books, and pamphlets in other languages and limited space to hold tutoring sessions. I think it would be fantastic if there were more spaces to interact and talk without our tutors. At present, there are only three small rooms in the basement and they are often reserved way in, in advance. Uh, there were many occasions when my tutor and I would tour the library looking for a space to hold our sessions. Sometimes we sat in a hallway or the second floor or in the art gallery. We often meet other tutors and students looking for a space. The need is great in Amherst because of all the international students and residents, the ESL program is so successful that there is often a waiting list for available tutors. I appreciate that the staff at the library and in the ESL program uh, reflect the character of the multicultural community. They have made me feel that I am not alone in a strange country away from my family in Mexico. I am very grateful to all the support from the ESL program. I was able to get a job at a local daycare as a PCA and to volunteer in a chemistry lab at UMass. The library uh, offers many programs for children. The programs help my kids adapt and connect easily with the community. It would be very helpful if the children and computer areas were expanded. The present areas are very crowded on the weekends during vacations and in the summer. The crafts room is very small in the basement. Uh, in the winter, when the weather is not our best ally, you believe me, the John Library is the best place for children to have fun, be creative, and connect with other children. And it is often crowded. Uh, it gets very crowded during the long-awaited annual Harry Potter event. As we say in Spanish, en ese lugar no cabe ni una aguja. That means there isn't any space even for a needle. Since the first week that I arrived here, the Jones Library has been a wonderful place for my children and I. I am very thankful, but I do feel that enlarging the space for the ESL program and for the children would make it even better. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Isabel. Uh, Pat, you have your hand up. Would you please come in and state your full name and where you live? Good evening. My name is Pat Ananibako, and I live um, on Tamarack Drive, South Amherst. I'm here to echo what previous uh, speakers um, have said about um, getting a, a funding allocation for reparation for Amherst. I have lived in Amherst for more than 35 years. I raised my five children here. And to be a black woman living in Amherst or even in any part of the country is not easy. Having to struggle and face discrimination every day in my life. 
And I feel for the first time uh, hopeful last year when uh, the, the town council um, have made commitment to address racism and equity. Therefore, um, in order to get this work done, it requires some funding. So I'm urging you to please allow the town manager to um, provide funding to get the work for reparation permits going. Thank you for your time. Pat, thank you for your comments. That ends our comment period. We're going back to the full agenda. And I would ask that the library trustees and others presenting with them now turn your videos on if you would like. You don't have to. Um, we are going to begin with the Jones Board of Library Trustees. I want to recognize that the trustees have joined us tonight. And we're going to pause for a moment and have Austin call the meeting uh, to order for the Jones Library Trustees. Austin. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, I want to call the meeting of the Jones Library Trustees uh, to order. I'm going to ask that the library trustees present uh, acknowledge their presence uh, when I call their names. Uh, Robert Pam. Present. Alex Lefebvre. Present. Tammy Ely. Present. Chris Hoffman. Present. Who have I missed? And I'm Austin Sarrett, I am present as well. And I but believe Lee, Lee Edwards is here. Lee, Lee Edwards, Lee? I see her box, but she is muted. Lee Edwards. Lynn, we have a quorum present, so I think we can proceed. Thank you. In a moment, we're going to show the video that the library has produced it has been developed along with a slide presentation to answer the many questions that the council put together in their memo that was approved on um, January 4th. Um, at, after the presentation, I will call on counselors who have questions. And I'm going to ask you to choose your top two questions and then make sure that other questions from other counselors are able to be asked. Um, we will then have an opportunity if there is an answer to those questions tonight. Uh, and if it's obvious as to who will answer those, I will direct the question. Otherwise, I will direct it to um, Austin, uh, the chair of the library trustees. It is very likely that not all of the questions will be answered this evening, either because we run out of time or more information is needed to provide a complete answer. I am asking all counselors to send me any unanswered questions by noon on Wednesday. We will not be taking a vote this evening. However, we have a motion to refer the Jones Library presentation and all other accompanying documents and reference documents to the Finance Committee to review the financial elements of each option and provide that review to the Town Council for consideration at their meeting on Monday, April 5th, 2021. With that, we're going to go ahead and view the um, video. Good evening. My name is Austin Sarrett, and I'm president of the Jones Library Board of Trustees. I want to thank you for giving us the chance to present and discuss our plan for a renovation in addition to the Jones. Having completed all the work needed to move that plan to fruition, last October, the Library Board of Trustees unanimously voted to approve the renovation and addition plan that we will discuss tonight. The board also voted to request that the Amherst Town Council approve that plan by the end of April. Those votes were the culmination of more than a decade of careful planning, extensive deliberation and consultation, and continuing commitment to ensuring that Amherst Library served the needs of all its residents. Endorsing the proposal we present tonight will make a great library even better and sustain its greatness into the future. 
The proposal that we are presenting points us towards a bright future in which the Jones will continue to nurture democratic values and support a vibrant and inclusive culture in our town. Our proposal emerged from a careful study of the library's programs and functions. It embodies what the Jones needs to serve the town well for the next several decades. It provides for expanding the children's room, providing a much needed teen space, dealing with the inadequacies of our special collection and English as a second language facilities, and it will make the building accessible for all Amherst residents. It will also make the library a model for sustainability while preserving and restoring the unique history of the Jones building. Just to be clear, the vital improvements that we are proposing cannot be accommodated within the existing facility or in any feasible rearrangement of the Jones building. At the start of the process that led to the current plan, we asked our architects to study whether and how to realize those improvements within the current building by reorganizing existing spaces or expanding within the existing footprint. They showed us that even if we added several stories to the library, we'd still not be able to do all that needs to be done. Still, some might ask, why move forward with this plan now? The trustees are asking the town council to approve the plan by the end of April for many reasons, not the least of which is because we expect to be awarded on Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners grant in July of 2021. And because the MBLC rules allow towns to move forward in anticipation of state funding. Taking advantage of state funding is a once in a decade opportunity. We're asking you to move forward because we now have a sound and feasible financial plan for the project. That plan includes a library commitment of $6 million to help offset some of the town's costs. And interest rates remain extremely low. So this is in fact a great time to borrow. As you will hear, we've already achieved remarkable success in our fundraising efforts. We've raised $13 million from the state, a million from CPA funds pending town council approval, and more than a million dollars in private pledges towards a total library commitment of a little more than $6 million. We're asking you to approve our plan this spring because the serious maintenance issues and structural problems which plague the Jones building urgently need to be addressed. We're asking you to approve our plan this spring because a detailed study requested by the town council of the cost of addressing the problems with the building by repairing the existing building showed that it would cost between 14 and $16 million to do such repairs. Those costs are very close to the amount the town would have to contribute to achieve a renovated, expanded, accessible, and environmentally sustainable Jones Library. This slide shows the taxpayer cost comparison, comparing the renovation and addition plan with the two repair estimates about which you will hear more in a few minutes. We're asking you to approve our plan this spring because delay risks both an escalation in costs and a further deterioration of the building. And because ch children, teens, English language learners, immigrants, disadvantaged people, students of Amherst history, families, book lovers, and all of the more than 225,000 people who come to the library every year, all of them deserve a facility that is as inspiring as their dreams. We believe that a renovated and expanded Jones Library will be a beacon of hope and a reminder that a great town deserves a great library. On this slide, you'll see the agenda for the rest of our presentation. 
You'll first hear about the financing plan for the project, then about the project's history, development, and time, timeline. Then we'll review the architectural plans and the future staffing needs of the building. We'll subsequently review the repair mm -hmm. estimates and conclude with a discussion of how our plan fits into a vision of Amherst, which puts environmental sustainability and social justice at the center of this wonderful community's commitments. And to carry on with our presentation about financing of the project, I'd now like to call on Kent Ferber. Thank you, Austin. There are many financial aspects to what we'll talk about tonight. If the proposed renovation and expansion project goes forward, the three most important are a capital campaign, including historic tax credits, the role of the library's endowment, and the participation of town funding. You'll hear tonight about each of them. And you'll also hear about the finances of any repair option as well. I'm here as the co-chair with Lee Edwards of the Capital Campaign Committee of the Friends of the Jones Library, which has undertaken to raise the $6.6 .6 million trustee commitment shown by Austin toward the financing of the proposed renovation and expansion project. We have a good plan and a good start. The plan has five segments, each with its own goal. Starting from the top, we already have obtained a $1 million recommendation for a CPA grant. However, we've been unable to start the next two segments, targeting foundations, financial institutions, and other government sources, simply because we can't apply to these sources without a certain project. The same is true for historic tax credit about which you'll hear shortly. But we're confident we can achieve the targets shown for these segments when that obstacle is removed. Finally, we're also confident about our ability to meet our goal for the last segment, a community campaign aimed at individual donors. Mounting such a campaign is a major undertaking involving dozens of volunteers and hundreds of prospects. Without knowing for certain whether the project will go forward, this is hardly credible. In addition, for most of last year, the pandemic's economic uncertainty and severe restrictions on human interaction have made it even more difficult to begin that process. Zoom is just not adequate to nurture the kind of trust, knowledge, and commitment necessary for either an effective campaign organization or the larger gifts needed. Nevertheless, in the last six weeks, as the grip of the pandemic has begun to loosen and its financial consequences are clearer to potential donors, we've begun once again to ramp up both our organizing and our contacts with major donors. A 19-person capital campaign committee held its first meeting last week, and we have once again begun contacting prospects for the purpose of soliciting gifts particularly at the lower end of our gift table. In that short period of time, I'm happy to report significant success. In the table you see, you can find the number of commitments we have at each level, including one at $300,000, which was given to us early last March before the onset of the pandemic, a bequest we have received and committed to the campaign at $273,000, two commitments over $100,000, and so on. They comprise our present total of over $1 million toward our $3 million goal. And when you add in the $1 million in CPA funds, we're just over 30% of the way toward the trustee's $6.6 .6 million commitment, significantly reducing the exposure of the library's endowment and demonstrating the depth, if not the breadth, of support for this project. In the fundraising trade, ramping up an annual fund for operating expenses is a common pre-campaign strategy, identifying prospects and volunteers and building the climate of generosity that's required for larger gifts. By taking this on as well, the Friends have not only persuaded over 750 families to almost double the total raised, but have also relieved Sharon and her staff of the substantial burden and expense of administering it. Between the increased amount raised and the cost savings of the library, we estimated that at a distribution rate of 4.5%, we've added the equivalent of another $1.5 million to the library's endowment. 
We anticipate continuing to grow the annual fund in the future. So far then, we're almost one third of the way without having a definite project in the middle of a pandemic and without having been able to get started. And we buttress the endowment as well with a much stronger annual fund. Can we raise the rest? The Survival Center finished the campaign for two and a half million dollars seven years ago. And the Hitchcock Center is currently closing its campaign at seven million dollars. As the Chief Development Officer of Amherst College and the President of the Community Foundation, I was regularly tasked with raising twice this amount every year. I'm confident we can do this. Thank you for your careful attention to this. I'd be happy to answer any questions or discuss any of this further. And let me turn it over to Doug Kelleher who can talk about historic tax credit. Thank you, Kent. Uh, as Kent mentioned, my name is Doug Kelleher. I'm a principal here at Epsilon Associates, and I'm gonna be talking a little bit about uh, historic tax credits and how they may be a uh, important funding source for, for the project. Um, just a little bit about Epsilon. Epsilon is an environmental engineering consulting firm based here in Maynard, Massachusetts. Um, one of our key practice areas is our historic preservation practice. Um, we have a group of historic preservation professionals who assist um, clients, property owners, and institutions in securing the necessary historic approvals for their projects. Um, and, and part of that is helping them secure state and federal historic tax credits um, to help finance their projects. What I'm going to be talking about um, specifically is the Massachusetts Historic Rehabilitation Tax Credit. Um, the Massachusetts Historic Tax Credit is a uh, tax credit uh, against um, taxes owed to the Massachusetts Department of Revenue, so state taxes. Um, they are credits that can either be used by an applicant um, who has secured them for the approval of, the, of their project, or um, more likely can be syndicated to an outside investor um, who is able to then use them to offset their own tax liability. Typically the way it works is the tax credits um, are sold for slightly less than the face value. Um, the benefit to the seller is they're able to turn credits, which they may not have an immediate need or any need for, and in the case of a nonprofit, um, to in, convert it into a form of equity to help finance the project. The benefit to the investor is they're able to purchase them, again, for slightly less than face value, but yet are able to use them for the full face value to offset their own state tax credit liability. Um, the way the, the program works, it's a, it's a program that's administered by the Massachusetts Historical Commission, which is the State Historic Preservation Office here in Massachusetts. Um, it's a up to 20% credit. Um, and what that is, it's, it's up to 20% of the qualified rehabilitation costs associated with the project. Um, for example, all projects have, you know, a total project costs and of the total project costs, some of those costs qualify towards the credits, some of them do not. In the case here with the Jones, the work associated with the rehabilitation and restoration of the historic building would qualify towards the credit. So the 1.6 million figure you saw earlier is based on the up to 20% of the cost, anticipated cost of the rehabilitation of the historic portion of the building. The credits do not count towards new construction um, or site work. Um, so those costs associated with, with the new addition would not qualify towards the credits. Um, the Massachusetts Historical Commission reviews um, and accepts applications for the program three times a year, those being in January, April, and August. Um, projects that do not receive the full um, amount that they're eligible for are able to reapply in subsequent rounds um, and request additional credits. And they can continue to do that, reapply in, in each subsequent round until either the project is completed and placed into service or until they receive the full 20% that they're eligible for. And for all intents and purposes, most, most if not all projects um, need to apply in multiple application rounds in order to get anywhere near the, the full 20% credit that they're, that they're eligible for. Projects need to be consistent with the Secretary of Interior Standards, um, which is a set of national um, guidelines um, established by the National Park Service. And basically, the, for those of you who are not familiar with the Secretary of Interior Standards, it talks about how the character-defined features of a building need to be retained and preserved as part of the project. 
Um, they do allow for new construction. Um, the standards as it relates to new construction talks about that they need that the new construction needs to be designed in a manner to be complementary to the historic building while not overwhelming the, the historic building. Um, so I think I what might be helpful is to show you a few examples of, of our projects in the area um, to give you a sense of what types of projects might be able to qualify for this. So, next. so this is the Pratt Memorial Library, also known as the Arms Library in Shelburne Falls. This is a project that our office was involved with that included the rehabilitation of the historic building. There was no additions here, um, but building systems were upgraded, finishes on the historic interior and exterior were, were preserved. Um, a new children's reading room was added to, to the basement level. Um, copper dome was, um, a new copper dome was added to the roof. The roof ceiling tiles were, were rehabilitated. Next. This is an example of a, of a commercial project um, in Northampton, um, the Gaywood School, located at the former Clark School for the Deaf. Um, this is a uh, commercial uh, rehabilitation of this historic property that included a significant large um, new addition added onto it. Um, you can see how the, the new addition was designed in a manner to be complementary to the historic character of the original building. This is another example of, of a, another library project out in Stockbridge, the Stockbridge Library Museum and Archives. This is a building um, or a project that included not only the, the rehabilitation of the historic building, both on the interior and exterior, but also a new addition um, that allowed for increased accessibility throughout the building, um, as well as upgrading the, the building systems and the uh, archive facilities at, at the lower level. So there, those are just a few examples of um, some of our historic projects that I think are similar to, to the Jones. Um, happy to answer any additional questions. With that, I think I'm turning it over to Bob. My name is Bob Pam, and I'm a trustee and the treasurer of the Jones Library. You've already heard about the library's fundraising plans and prospects. The library anticipates that over the course of the project, the grant solicitations and our community efforts will produce enough money to achieve the campaign goal. The issue is when. Our plan is to temporarily cover any deficit by using portions of the library endowment. What will happen and how would that impact our operations? The endowment finances a little over half of the non-town funded expenses of the library books, light and heat, programming, and the other costs that we cover in our budget. Uh, we can't do without it, but because of the way we've constructed it, we can do without some of it as long as the shortfall is limited and does not last too long. As we explain in our submission, our withdrawals to cover operations are calculated based on the last full year of data before we prepare our budget. So, for example, the fiscal year 22 budget includes data for the three years ending in June 2020. Further, it averages the data from the 12 quarters ending at that date, so that spikes in value have less impact and draws do not shift greatly from year to year. A substantial drop in value, if not replaced, is therefore delayed by one year, then the impact rises by one third in each of the three following years. We do not expect a long-term continuing drop to happen for several reasons. The size of the endowment depends on three things, contributions, withdrawals, and market performance. If we withdraw funds to cover a shortfall, the recovery will depend on compensating gifts, the size of normal draws, and market performance. Project-related withdrawals would be caused by a shortfall in contributions by the date of project completion. We know that the sale of tax credits, for example, can only occur after a certificate of occupancy is issued. If the town wants our commitment met before that sale, the shortfall will be temporary and not significant. Green contributors may similarly want to see our energy usage experience after completion. These are built into the process and will deal with the consequences. It is possible that the shortfall will be actual rather than deferred. Completion of the project will not end fundraising. With inviting spaces for all segments of our community and the excitement at the completion of this communal centerpiece, we expect that contributions will continue to flow in. This is, by the way, how the current building was constructed. 
of the original $600,000 inheritance that created the Jones, over half was spent to build this Amherst landmark. And within four years, the community restored $200,000. The MBLC grant, other probable state grants, and the town share make our burden proportionately much smaller. I've tried to model the impact that a real shortfall of $2 million would have on our ability to fund library operations, including what I consider worst case possibilities. First, while the endowment is now more than $9 million, I assume that it will start and remain at $8 million through the construction period. I have used that although our returns over the past five years have averaged about 9% per year. The historic average for a portfolio structured like ours is of the order of 7%. But Vanguard has told us to expect the next 10 year average will be lower than this. If nothing comes in after the project is completed and our earnings never exceed our current draw, we would have to raise our withdrawal rate, lower our expenses, and hope for higher annual contributions. But that is not all likely to happen. More likely are scenarios in which the gap is filled over conservatively over a five or at most eight year period. In either case, draws in the range of four to four and a half percent would maintain our ability to sustain operations at the current rate even where investment returns don't exceed our withdrawals. Alternately, assume no new contributions are received, but market returns exceed our draw by no more than one or 2%, then we could still sustain about $300,000 per year for operations. So is there a risk? Yes, but the library finds it an acceptable one. There is another factor that we have considered. As you know, we have consolidated all of our fundraising with the Friends of the Jones Library. So our out outreach to potential project donors also includes our annual appeals for operating funds. This has had very positive effects. More dollars raised, more contributors, and higher dollar amounts from many regular contributors. There is a synergistic impact. Our efforts are producing substantial pledges but also more funds unconnected to our endowment draws. This reduces the centrality of endowment draws altogether. This is my conclusion in this area. Continued success in fundraising and seeking grants can do the whole job, eliminate anything more than a short-term deficit. The level of shortfall that seems possible can be handled and cured between continued fundraising, annual appeals, and historically normal investment returns. As to operating expenses, the redesign does not contemplate any major impacts. Our staff are town employees and the town's policy is to treat the budget allocations to the library like its allocations to the schools and town direct the reports as a fixed percentage of the prior year's allocation. Since we may be more impacted by the rising minimum wage than others, we supplement the town funding with our other income and or we adjust our staffing. We expect that we will reduce our energy costs by about 8% despite the larger building size because of our improved energy efficiency. But this will only reduce our non-town funded budget by 2 to 3%. New equipment will of course reduce our maintenance costs and more particularly the cost to remediate the effects of systems failures. This area will be discussed again later in the presentation. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sean Mangano and I am the Director of Finance for the Town of Amherst. I have been working with the town's financial advisor to develop financing options for the library project. The goal being to provide the town and the council with information on the financial impacts of the library project and how this project fits within the plan for addressing other capital needs in town. I will be sharing two financing options tonight and briefly discussing a third. For each option at the top of the screen, you will see the types of borrowings proposed, the issue and state of the borrowing, the due date, and lastly, the projected interest rate. A GO bond or general obligation bond is a long-term borrowing and is used to lock in an interest rate over an extended period of time. A ban or bond anticipation note 
is a short-term borrowing, usually for a year or less. Underneath the information on the types of borrowings, you will see the projected debt schedule. The column to focus on here is labeled total. This column incorporates principal payments and long-term and short-term interest costs. You can see the annual payment for each year of the borrowing and the entire project cost at the bottom. The first financing option that you see here on the screen is for the expansion and renovation of the Jones Library. This option is being incorporated into the town's planning for the four major building projects. It is based on a schedule of projected expenditures provided by Colliers, the owner project manager. The option assumes a town will use grant monies first and only borrow when needed. This option also assumes the town approves the MBLC project in April and that the first grant payment is received in fiscal year 21 by the town. The local share to be borrowed is 15.8 million. The benefit of this option is the first debt payment is a couple years away, giving the town more time to ramp up its capital spending. The town would borrow funds in fiscal year 23, and the first debt payment would not be until fiscal year 24. The town would need to utilize a couple short-term borrowings to fund the project while waiting for the final grant funds to be dispersed. The total cost of this project with interest is projected to be 20.8 million over 20 years. And to recap, the town would not need to make a payment from its capital funds until fiscal year 24 if the project is approved in April. The financial advisor and I are looking closely at another approach to financing the expansion and renovation project where the town pays its share first and uses the grant monies last. This approach has been used in at least one other community and was suggested by a town counselor. The benefits of this option include locking interest rates in sooner, limiting the risk of rates rising in the future, and earning interest income on the grant funds that can be put back into the project, reducing the cost to the town. Under this approach, the town would make its first debt payment in FY22. Next financing option is for repair option one, prepared by Kuhn Riddle. This option spreads the repairs over the next five years and costs 16.8 million with cost escalation and swing space included. This option requires multiple borrowings due to the extended schedule. It is also subject to higher risk of rising interest rates for the borrowings farther in the future. The total cost for this project with short-term and long-term interest included is 23.7 million. This repair option would cost approximately $3 million more than the expansion and renovation option on the previous slide. Please note that all of the financing options are estimates and subject to change. Thank you. What we wanna do in the next part of our presentation is to tell you a little bit about the project's history. As I mentioned in the introduction, the project began through a planning process and a review and assessment of the work that the library needs to serve the community now and into the future. That process identified serious safety concerns, programming gaps, and significant space challenges in the building. Now, I wanna be clear, it was only after that process that we began to think about renovating and adding to the Jones and about applying for state funds. This is not a case of grant funding leading the process. It is a case of a careful planning process identifying needs that a state grant could help address. Our library director, Sharon Sherry, will now offer a more detailed account of the project's history, development, and timeline. Sharon. Hi, everybody. My name is Sharon Sherry. I'm the director of the Jones Library. I am going to take you back to the beginning, back to 2011, when this particular project began. I know it may seem as though this project happened quickly, but we want to assure you that every option has been diligently researched. Every point on these slides describes an event that occurred related to the project. And let me highlight the most important milestones we reached during our mission to find the best way to solve our building's problems. In the early stages, spending money wasn't something we were eager to do. We wanted to gain as much knowledge as we could 
without taking large draws from the endowment. Thus, in early 2012, we began with a space planning exercise, which was conducted by the Massachusetts Library System. Next, we invited the two MBLC library building specialists to tour the Jones, during which we were told that the, the Jones Library is the most dysfunctional library in the state. They recommended we apply for the upcoming planning and design grant in order to have the funds necessary to go through all the proper planning processes. In 2014, the trustees applied for and received a $50,000 planning and design grant from the MBLC, for which town meeting approved a $25,000 match. We were then able to write the building program, hire an owner's project manager, and an architect. Ever since the first set of schematics were created in 2016, they have gone through countless iterations. During that process, the architects conducted a massing model exercise, which showed the only way for all the program elements to fit in the existing Jones footprint would be to build an addition five stories high. In the spring of 2017, town meeting approved our submission of a $35.6 million grant application. And in the summer of 2017, the MBLC awarded the Jones with a provisional construction grant in the amount of $13.9 million. In 2018 and 2019, the Friends of the Library and the Trustees approved a Memorandum of Understanding, whereby the Friends would manage the library's annual fund and capital campaign. And the Friends got right to work, and they applied for a $1 million Community Preservation Act grant for the renovation of special collections. And that brings us to 2020, when the trustees approved the most recent set of schematics, as well as the Sustainability Committee's recommendations, making the expanded library net zero ready. Uh, next up, I want to introduce my colleague, Matt. Hello, everyone. My name is Matthew Burvey. I'm the head of information services at Jones, and I'm going to speak with you today on behalf of our library staff. We pride ourselves on delivering great services to the town and to everyone who visits us. But because the current Jones Library building is a significant obstacle, I'd like you to appreciate how much more we could deliver with a renovated and expanded building. I'm going to briefly highlight three areas in which the current building impacts our staff and our services. The first is safety and accessibility. Our building is full of rooms and corners and out of the way spots. In years past, these were charming features. Today, they are safety concerns. Many spaces are entirely unstaffed. Others are extremely difficult to monitor. Our staff need better sight lines throughout the building in order to maintain the safe, welcoming environment that our patrons expect and deserve. In addition, Many public and staff areas don't meet current accessibility standards, and others are completely inaccessible. The second area I'd like to highlight is programs and services. To put it in the simplest terms, we've outgrown many of our spaces. Our ESL and citizenship program is unable to provide adequate space for students, tutors, and groups to meet. Our special collections department is unable to grow and diversify its holdings of historical materials due to capacity limitations. Our kids department is spread over three levels and divided into rooms that are rarely large enough to accommodate programs and visiting families. And maybe most importantly, we have no dedicated space for teens. Teens want to spend time at the library and we want them to come. To give them their own space would be to welcome them in a way that we currently can't, despite the best efforts of our staff. The third area is flow and efficiency. The Jones Library building doesn't really flow, neither for patrons nor for staff. Many spaces are segmented and inflexible. Many traffic routes lead to bottlenecks or blind curves. The placement of and flow around service points makes it challenging to staff them. We have staircases that provide access to part of a level, but not the other part. We have an art gallery, and a special collections that many patrons are surprised to find after coming regularly for many years. Due to both its design 
and its evolution over the years, the building has become difficult to use. In addition, our technology needs have changed radically over the last 25 years, and our current power and network cabling doesn't allow for flexible use of our spaces. In conclusion, our staff are proud of our work, but we know that in an improved space, we can do better. Hello, uh, my name is Tony Schell. I'm a principal and director of design at Feingold Alexander and Associates. I'm delighted to be here. So I'm gonna talk a bit more about actually what we're doing for the expansion and a renovation of the Jones Library. And we'll just quickly, briefly touch upon sort of the schematic approach. And then there'll be further discussion, of course, about sustainability as well. But let's let's proceed. And I think we'll leave this image up for a second because what we want to explain in this design is that the approach really looks at trying to mask the design to scale well with the existing library. And what you see here in this particular rendering is showing is sort of breaking down the scale into two volumes that sort of nod towards the existing building. They have a roof shape that sort of bends and angles and keeping with the gable ends of the existing. It also allows us to mask the building into smaller pieces. And this particular view is taken from the back as one approaches it from the CVS parking lot in the rear, which allows also direct access at the lower level, which we'll see in a moment, leads into programmatic spaces that occur within. But we really feel that we're trying to blend the, the new addition, not only be compatible with the scale, but also materials that you're seeing here that also work with the existing building in terms of the masonry, the stone, the window treatment, the coloration and the rest of the design as it approaches the pr project as a whole. So I'm gonna go through uh, you know, the site plan and some of the floor plans. We'll talk about how this building is, is really a complement to the existing and addressing accessibility issues as well. So starting with the site plan and what we see here is that this overall project is viewed um, in this site plan, Google Earth View, and the way it's oriented is that Amity Street is at the bottom of the page and uh, North Pleasant Street to the right. And it's outlined in this particular drawing is that the dash line sort of shows the demarcation between the existing library portion, which we will renovate, and then the new addition, which is beyond. So the existing renovation uh, comprises about 28,000 square feet. And then the addition is an additional about 35,000 square feet. And as we look at this site plan, a couple of key things I just want to point out. The entrance will continue to come off of Amity Street but we're going to introduce sloped, gently sloped walkways that curve up to create an accessible entrance from the front. And the existing driveway on the side will continue to operate as such, but will also allow it to be servicing for the library. It'll be small handicap loading and also service uh, as well a connection to the existing addition in the back as it connects to the garden. And we'll point out that the garden is shown in the back uh, that connects to and is adjacent to the CVS parking lot and it will be really enhanced and, and built up with the already lovely characteristics of the garden as, as is. And so I really attempted to try to blend the library design, but also to try to enhance the landscaping uh, as we can around the front as well as in the back. And I'm not expecting this to be an eye chart, but this is the ground floor plan or what we call the garden level. And this is the plan that particularly shows what happens at the area that occurs from the entrance at the rear of the CPS lot. It's uh, at the top of the page. And when you come into that entrance at the back, what you see immediately to the left of that is the entrance to the meeting room in the dark blue. This allows direct access to the meeting space for both after hours use as well as normal hours use. And around that lot meeting room will be public toilets and other areas that will be in support of that space. So it can really function uh, for the library and community's use. The areas to the right of that library in this plan, in the sort of yellow area, that is sort of the, the special collections. This is where the operations, both as well as the staffing and the collections itself will be housed. And that is really occupying a pretty substantial part of this lower level. At the top of the page in the expanded new wing in the sort of darker red, that is the uh, ESL or English as Second Language Department. It will have a series of small meeting spaces and larger meeting spaces that can do dual use not only for that program, but for other library functions. And then to the right of that in the lighter pink is sort of the tech services that really uh, support the library functions. The other areas in the library that I will point out is that in the center of this blue zone, that is really the primary circulation. It will connect to a major stair that leads up to the main library above, as well as a new elevator. 
uh, and then shown at the very bottom are really support spaces, including additional mechanical storage, friends room, and then additional gallery spaces, which is the area in the yellow immediately below the blue meeting room in this plan. So this really has a lot of uh, key components and will function uh, as a both an accessible entrance at the lower level as well as connecting to the library above. So as we come to the main level, uh, at the bottom of this drawing, that is the entrance off of the main street. And therefore, this arrow that you can see here shows the entrance in. And the significant part of this particular plan is that we want to emphasize that you are coming through the historic entrance. It, again, is going to be handicap accessible at grade. And you come into there, and you will come through the vestibule, and you will see all the defining characteristics that make this library so special, including the staircases, the panelization, and details within. But as you move through the library, uh, we begin to see how the new addition really expands on the existing. So all the area in sort of the reddish color directly ahead is basically the new component, which will be the housing, the cafe, the periodicals, the new reading materials, AV, audio, visual, everything that is really the high activity zones on the ground floor of this main level. So this is where all that activity will open up and will begin to sort of be visible from everywhere. Now, to the left of that in the yellow will be the young, uh, young Children's Library. And that whole area will not only consist of the existing part of the historic library, but expands uh, in, in a significant way into the collections to the, to the upper part and to the left. So this will comprise the young adult, the, excuse me, the Children's Library, which is all in yellow. Um, in the purple behind, that is the uh, first part of the lower levels of the adult collections. And that's as shown in the expanded area that is viewing out towards the garden at the back. To the right of the staircase uh, in the sort of orange color, this is the young adult, uh, which is immediately visible, but also has its own area. It's adjacent to circulation. And then to the, to the far right at the front, this is really the other key parts of the library, which is the circulation areas that also consists of the, um, the drop-offs and will be processing and bringing in collections as well when people come in for instance after hours. And so this will probably be the hub of the library where a lot of the activities come together uh, at this particular level. As we move up into the main library itself uh, on the second floor, this is primarily the adult collection. Everything you show in purple really is the, is the adult fiction and nonfiction. And this really consists of a very open plan. The stacks will be very visible. The collections will be highly uh, accessible. Uh, and so this really allows uh, a major utilization of this level. In addition to that, at the front of the library in this purple area, that is the part of the existing library, which will continue to function basically as it is, but it will be meeting rooms and, excuse me, lounge areas, seating areas, and it will really function for the adults uh, to also gather in the historic library part. And we will restore, retain things like the fireplaces and really use the defining characteristics of the historic library as part of this level. Uh, the areas in sort of the blue color flanking it, these consist of smaller quiet study areas, small medium-sized meeting rooms, and then they're also to the right of that will consist of the head of the collections, uh, sort of office administrative areas. And then uh, to the upper part of that in the darker blue purple, this will be additional areas which will be mostly office areas related to the exec director, business managers, administrative areas, and there will also be a pair of public toilets that will be accessible as well. Again, what is shown here in the middle in the blue green color, that's the primary public circulation stair and elevator, which will connect to this level. And as a statement, the entire library is universally accessible throughout. And then finally, at the third floor, the top level, this is where in the exist, existing historic library portion will continue to function as the, uh, as the boardroom and additional meeting room in the blue area to the left. And then the sort of reddish color will represent staff support areas. And this will be accessible by the two stairs that connect up as well as the existing elevator in the sort of green purple. So this does represent the library in its levels and how we organize the parts. And then as part of this, we, we have prepared a series of um, sort of images. So on the left-hand side, this is the before view. This shows sort of the real density, uh, the fact that this library is functioning in a very tight quarters uh, and it's often really jam-packed. And then to the right, this is the proposed view and the rendering that shows how the new adult collection will, will appear. And what you're seeing here is that we are going to be looking to do a very sustainable approach. This is timber. Uh, construction uh, that is being uh, posited here with a lot of natural wood 
a tremendous amount of uh, natural daylight and views of flooding this area. And then you can also see a part of the existing library to the right hand side of the rendering visible within the adult collection. So this will transform this uh, space and will also open up the library for the patrons and, and community as well. Uh, another area is the uh, young adults. Um, uh, right now, of course, it, it is a very uh, small, almost just area that's, that's, that's practically left over in your existing area as visible in the photograph in the, in the left. And we will now be able to create a, a true and proper young adult room in part of your existing library as shown in this sketch on the right. And that is in that sort of double height space with the barrel vaults. And this will be a, a really wonderful place for the young adult they will have their own their own area. It is connected directly to the other parts of the library, uh, but they will suddenly and finally have a, a home of their own. So this is one of the byproducts of the redesign and replanning of the library. And then some of the background about who we are. Our, our firm has, has a long history of working in adaptive use, historic preservation. Uh, we really have a have a, a very uh, strong reputation in this kind of work. This is an example of the kind of things we do. This happens to be the executive office at the state house for the governor's uh, suite. So we restored these particular areas for the governor's office. Uh, and this is the kind of high level of careful detailing and planning and execution when we look at historic spaces and how to restore and bring them back to life. And other examples, uh, this is at the Harvard Baker Library at the business school. And here we were charged not only with a major renovation and restoration of, of spaces such as the great reading rooms, that you can see in some of these photos, but we also did an addition that seamlessly blended the new to the existing on this particular library for Harvard. So these are the kind of areas that we also get involved with, additions as well as renovation. And then more recently, a project um, not far from uh, the Jones Library is the Holyoke Library. And in this instance, we were charged not only with restoring a major part of the existing library, but we actually did remove a piece of the library here in the, in the stack wing, and then we opened it up to be a major new addition that, that created all the programmatic spaces that Holyoke needed that blended seamlessly between old and the new. And one of the things that we always try to pay particular attention to in our library designs is how do we integrate uh, additions and uh, existing fabric so that they really call together as one. So these are the kind of things that we are all looking for in the design. And of course, the most important thing that we're, uh, you've already experienced is the importance of sustainability as we approach all of our projects. So I think that concludes the, the overview of the kind of design approach for this library. So before we touch upon sustainability, uh, the other uh, very important thing that we do wanna stress is that, of course, while we're dealing with uh, our current situation with COVID, uh, the design of this library is with every intention also really planning for that to be accounting for things like that. The, the flexibility inherent in this design allows for the planning of the library to really function, whether it's in full open mode or in sort of partial open mode or dealing with what we're dealing with now. So we're very cognizant of how we design the library and the systems we introduce, including mechanical and other things, really do take this into account. Um, so that's an important part of any consideration of the library as we're moving forward. Now, I would like to turn the next part to Alex, uh, who's gonna talk about our, the sustainability approach to the library. Hi, my name is Alex Lefebvre and I'm a trustee of the Jones Library. The Jones Library created a sustainability committee made up of individuals who are passionate about climate action and professionals in the field of sustainability and sustainable design. Through the hard work and dedication of this committee, an updated schematic design for the renovation and expansion was approved by the Board of Trustees. The committee set four goals to be incorporated by the architects into the updated design. First, sustainable buildings must be highly efficient in how they operate. Building efficiency can be measured and put into a number that can be compared to other buildings. This measurement reflects the energy used per square foot or an EUI. The current building does not operate efficiently with an EUI of 72, but is typical of libraries nationally. The updated design will cut the building's EUI by more than half to 29. This means that even though the overall square footage of the building will increase, the building will be so efficient that the actual operational carbon and financial cost to run the building will decrease significantly. Secondly, a net zero energy ready building refers to a building that is efficient enough that all of its annual energy needs can be provided by renewable energy. The newly constructed addition will be the workhorse, increasing the operational efficiency to the point where the entire building can be powered solely by renewable energy 
making it net zero ready. While some solar panels will be added to the addition, the historic nature of the original building and the limited on-site space for renewable energy preclude a net zero building on day one. The building, however, could easily move from net zero ready to net zero with the purchase of off-site renewables. Third, creating an efficient building is only part of the formula when looking to lower our carbon footprint. The construction process has a large impact on the environment, generating about 11% of all global emissions. Every time we make or build something, we're using fossil fuel energy to create that product and emit carbon. There are product choices and construction techniques that can be used that emit less carbon than others. Low embodied carbon refers to the environmental impact of materials that are used in construction. The committee wanted to be sure to find a balance between creating more efficiency in the building with using low carbon materials. By changing the major structural system from steel to cross laminated timber, the carbon impact of construction was reduced by 70%. The committee also recognized the challenges of making an existing historic building sustainable. It was important to make sure that improving the building and creating the addition made sense from both an energy efficiency as well as a sustainability point of view. To determine if the renovation and expansion are in fact the more sustainable option, the architects were directed to conduct a whole building life cycle analysis for the proposed design. This means that they analyzed the carbon impact of all stages of construction and operation and compared it to the carbon emissions of the existing building. The resulting analysis concluded that leaving the building as is created significantly more carbon emissions than the combined impact of the demolition, new construction, and operation of the renovated and expanded building. A renovated and expanded library will move the town one step closer to its goal of carbon neutrality and community resiliency by converting an inefficient fossil fuel powered building to a class leading sustainable net zero ready building with a space, programming, and resources to help our most vulnerable neighbors. The library project would also be one of the first major projects for the town that addresses embodied carbon. These added sustainability features will also provide additional access to funding, grants, and rebates that are specific to sustainable design. We hope that this building design and the work of the sustainability committee can serve as a model that we can build efficient buildings where the net carbon footprint is actually better and still create a building that serves the needs of the whole community. Thank you. Next, I'm gonna talk a bit about how the trustees will be able to afford to operate the expanded library, specifically in terms of utilities and personnel costs. The updated sustainable design will eliminate the use of fossil fuels and is projected to reduce the building's total energy use by 48%. This means that even though the overall square footage of the building will increase, the building will be so efficient that the actual operational cost to run the building will decrease by an estimated 8%. No repair option can meet that. The recent history costs for both gas and electricity have evidenced rising prices, but we hope that as the costs of renewable energy continue to fall, that this will be reflected in lower consumer electricity prices. At some point, we may be able to participate in town supplied solar power at a lower cost. On average, roughly 78% of the library's operating budget is allocated for personnel costs. Although library employees are town employees, the town does not appropriate an amount equal to 100% of the library's personnel costs. Every year, we must repurpose funds from other sources to make up the difference. We will continue to cover this gap regardless of what option the town chooses to address the deficiencies of the building. We anticipate that the expansion and renovation project may require one additional staff position of a custodian. Despite the larger square footage, we do not anticipate needing other additional staff because the improved open and efficient design, which will allow for clear sight lines. Combined with the installation of an automated materials handling system, which will allow staff to remain focused on forward facing customer service tasks. These gained efficiencies will allow staffing to remain level as we will be able to use our existing staff much more effectively than is possible in the current building. Next up. Is Elon. Thanks, Sharon. 
Hi, my name is Elon Tierney. I am president of Kuhn Real Architects right here in downtown Amherst. In early 2020, Jones Library engaged KRA to assist in determining what accessibility repairs would be triggered by the proposed building repairs outlined in the 2017 Western Builders Building Improvement Cost Estimate. The Western Builders Estimate included repairs or replacement of the following items. The large central skylight, replacement of the south elevator, interior improvements such as finish upgrades, replacing carpeting, painting, etc. Mechanical, electrical, and plumbing improvements, replacing systems that are at or near the end of their life. Structural improvements, such as those caused by the replacement of the skylight and the elevators. Exterior improvements, such as masonry, window, and trim repair and replacement. KRA was not part of the initial repair assessment. We were only hired to review what additional work would be required to make the Jones Library meet the minimum accessibility requirements. The accessibility requirements that we reviewed are based on the minimum requirements outlined in the Massachusetts State Building Code, and it only and it is only repairs to existing features, such as replacing door hardware, ensuring that there is proper egress and access paths to that are of an appropriate width, properly sized elevators, accessible toilet rooms, proper signage, etc. This study does not look at changing the space programmatically. It does not look at improving the space. It only looks at what needs to be changed if the spaces were to stay primarily as it is today and meet minimum accessibility requirements. It does not look at, at replacing furniture such as stacks, um, but it does look at providing accessible work and computer stations or study areas. And the study did not look at sustainability upgrades. Should a repair option be selected, the library would need to relocate for the work to be done. And similar to the new construction options, debris removal is incorporated into the costs. We looked at two repair options. And as part of this study, the Jones Library Board of Trustees requested that we review if the proposed work could be performed in phases and at what point the value of the work would require full compliance with the accessibility code. In reviewing these potential phases, it was also asked of us to consider the following. What is the most logical flow of work based on discrete construction projects? What work has a higher priority based on the age of the systems or deterioration of building systems? What is the most cost-effective way to approach phases? And what, if any work, could be completed while the library remains occupied? This first scenario represents the lowest cost first approach, and it looks at three potential phases. The first phase being replacement of the skylight and south elevator, a 30-week project which would require the library to be closed and relocated for that time period. Construction would cost $1.47 million, and total project costs with designer fees and relocation costs would be 2.3 million. Phase two occurring three years later would be exterior improvements, a 26 week project which would allow the library to remain open during construction. Construction costs with three years of escalation would be a little over $2 million and total project costs with designer fees would be $2.26 million. Phase three, two years later, would be uh, interior, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing, and structural and accessibility improvements. This is the point when the accessibility improvements are triggered. It's a 52-week project, which would require the library to be closed and relocated for that time period. Construction with five years of escalation would cost $10.18 million, and total project costs with designer fees and relocation costs would be almost $12.3 million. In this Repair option one, total costs after all three phases is about $16.8 million. Repair option two looks at the MEP improvements first, as this is the highest priority work due to the age and condition of those systems. It is not possible to do this work without touching aspects of the structural improvements or interior improvements. 
And once that work is included, it triggers the accessibility improvements. The accessibility improvements would require the south elevator to be replaced. And since the skylight is also in poor condition, we, re we would recommend that the first phase include replacement of the skylight. So option two, first phase, is all of the interior work, a 52-week project which would require the library to be closed and relocated. Construction would cost 10.3 million and total project cost with designer fees and relocation costs would be just over 12 million. Two years later, exterior improvements could be completed, a 26-week project which would allow the library to remain open during construction. Construction cost with three years of escalation would be a little over 2 million and total project cost with designer fees would be 2.26 million. If these projects were completed in this time frame, the total cost would be $14.37 million. And now I think I turn it back to for the conclusion. Amherst is committed to reducing greenhouse gas emissions and building resilience in our community. This commitment led to the creation of an Energy and Climate Action Committee, a net zero bylaw, and an effort to achieve carbon neutrality no later than 2050. Our community recognizes that the climate crisis affects all of us, but falls the hardest on our most vulnerable community members. The proposal to renovate and add to the Jones Library building will be one of our first major opportunities to make climate action our priority. The Jones Library is a beloved institution, but its current building is stretched to the limits by the 225,000 visitors we receive each year. The creation of an addition to the library will remove the limitations that exist in the current building and provide vital extra space needed to remove barriers for members of our community who are unable to fully access the library's services and programs. With a larger building, the library can provide more computers to the 3,000 Amherst residents who do not have access to internet at home. It will help visiting scholars, immigrants, refugees fleeing war, and the families of 32% of our elementary age students who speak English as a second language build strong connections in our community while they learn and practice English, study for citizenship exams, and meet their neighbors. A larger, more efficiently designed building will ensure that families with young children have a dedicated space that is large enough to accommodate everyone who wants to attend library programs, meet other families, and find a little respite and connection. Increasing the square footage of our current building allows the library to create a dedicated, safe space for teenagers whose suicide rates have increased by 64% in Massachusetts, a space where they will know they are represented, accepted, supported, and nurtured to dream, grow, and thrive. A library reflects the values of its community. A 21st century library that is large enough to equitably serve everyone in our community and is housed in a sustainable, net zero ready building supports and reflects a vision of Amherst, which places social, racial, and climate justice at the center of our community. So I want to thank you for listening attentively to this uh, presentation. I hope that you can see why we are as excited as we are about the possibilities for a renovation and an addition at the Jones Library. And we're all eager for the conversation and eager to answer your questions. Thanks again. Thank you for your presentation and for all of the effort that went into putting that presentation together. I want to remind people, both in the audience on Amherst Media and on the Zoom meeting, as well as the people who are in the meeting, that this presentation now remains available for anyone to look at and review, along with the slide presentation, uh, et cetera, that is part of the report. Uh, I just want to recognize that Representative Dom has joined us in the audience and her ongoing interest in this project and other things important to Amherst. I also want to mention that we are not going to get into a debate tonight regarding whether we're going to approve the recommendation of the CPA funds or whether it's going to be attributed to fundraising or to the town's debt size. Okay. And finally, um, we will be adding questions that also have come to us via email so that people who have in the audience 
or people who have sent us in emails, those questions will be added to the other questions that the counselors have tonight that we might not be able to get to. Uh, so with that, I would like to see a show of hands of people who'd like to ask a question. All right, Pat DeAngelis. Thank you. Um, if the project were to move ahead, uh, would there be ways to shift um, investment towards reductions, more reductions in embodied carbon, carbon and operational carbon while reducing construction costs and not compromising the design com concept? Uh, for example, uh, the, there's a, a more judicious use of glazing might um, really be helpful. You could focus the roof glazing at key areas such as the stairs and seating rather than over the entire stack area. You could also take the sawtooth thing um, and reduce some of that to uh, more curve, smaller curved skylights, um, which would be helpful. Uh, a lot of the roof light that are would be over the stacks is it's it's expensive, it's prone to failure, and it adds to heat and loss and cooling expenses. So, can there be those kinds of shift in the design? Okay, um, I'm going to just pause for a moment and ask whether there is anybody who would like to address that, or do we want to just put that question aside? Uh, I think Tony from FAA might uh, want to give you give a preliminary response. Tony? Sure. Uh, uh, great question. Um, absolutely. I think when we go into the next phase of these kind of detailed investigations, they'll get much more in depth. We have just basically completed a schematic level design. And so there's a lot of that kind of uh, follow-up that we need to follow through uh, in answer to that question, Patricia. We, we do know that the analysis of lighting is very critical, but the amount of glazing also plays a huge part in terms of energy demand. So these are the things we will be exploring. Uh, one of the things we did try to consider in the sawtooth approach was to look at the idea that it was a combination of bringing uh, natural daylight in, but also allowing for PVs to occur on the sawtooth part. But these are all design details and will continue to evolve. So thank you for your question. Thank you, Pat. Steve Schreiber. Again, we're gonna to stay to the one or two question rule tonight, Steve. Yeah, so thank you so much. So uh, my question, so a lot of people have commented that it's jarring to the prospect of a 1993 edition being demolished and then replaced is jarring to a lot of people in Amherst, in particular because there are a lot of people around that were very involved in the 1993 edition. So um, I think I personally understand who I've been following this quite a bit, so I understand what the problems are, or how we got here, and um, you know, certainly understand that that is the only logical solution to reach, or at least that's what I believe the only logical solution to reach the goals of the the Jones on this particular site. But my question is, the, I have two questions here: What are we going to do to make sure that whatever project we're doing now won't meet the same fate and just 30 years from now. So actually, that's my question. Thank you, Steve. Again, I'm going to ask Tony to give us a little bit of sense from the architect's point of view of how we're going to avoid that problem. Tony. Let me unmute. Um, I, I think what's really important in the consideration of any project we do is, one, how do we really carefully execute the thinking of the design to fulfill the vision that is looking forward to not just the next few years, but the next several decades, because this is a once shot that you know you have in a way to get it right. But I think part of that too is how a close attention we pay to how we detail the building, how we ensure that we don't encounter the problems uh, that you currently have. And a lot of that really relies on very careful um, execution and understanding not only of your existing building, of how to improve it, and all the things that we're going to do to renovate. But in the design of the new addition to be as efficient as also 
in terms of sustainable, but in using materials that will last and details that will not be, you know, um, extraordinarily subject to challenges. So I think this is the kind of thing as architects, we, we pay very close attention to, and we've had a long history on doing projects uh, of similar nature and, and complexity as, as here. And we do know that, that the requirement of looking at buildings have requires a lot of very careful expertise and a lot of eyes on a project. Thank you. George Ryan. Yeah, I have two very quick questions. Uh, one has for Doug, actually. I'm just curious about the tax credits. I guess I'm assuming there's a market out there and that it's not hard to find people to buy them. Um, that's just a question about who would actually purchase a tax credit. Um, the second is for Elon. Um, the, when I look at uh, repair option number one, I wonder why anyone would choose it. So I just get a sense if one had to choose between the two, you think you would do the, the cheaper one. Um, what What is the, uh, uh, why would one do repair option one? Okay, so let's go to um, Matt, I believe for tax credits. Actually, this is Doug Kelleher. I'll take a stab at that. Okay. Thank so, you. So there's no shortage of um, people looking to purchase these tax credits, um, largely because there's no shortage of people who have tax liability that have to pay taxes. Um, so we've uh, have never had an instance where we've had uh, particularly state tax credits where there's no appetite for uh, an investor. So um, I don't see that being an issue at all. Okay, and Eileen? The second question, why would you choose option one? You're muted. Sorry. Um, it, we, the, the first option is uh, looking at three phases and the three phases are focused on lowest cost first um, to minimize the initial investments and avoid triggering the accessibility requirements, which are the most expensive. So it's not a recommended option. It's just looking at lowest cost first. Okay, thank you. Um, Andy Steinberg. Well, first of all, I wanna thank the, uh, everybody for the presentation um, and answering the questions that have already been provided. I have one additional question that may be about MBLC. Um, grant process and it may be a general contracting um, question, but what happens in a library um, so, uh, building plan if the um, ultimate uh, uh, contract is sent out to bid and nobody bids for the amount that's consistent with the financing plan that MBLC and the council have approved. Austin, do you want to direct that question? Yeah, I think it'd either go to Tony or, or um, Ken or George from the OPM point of view. So I don't know whether Tony or Ken or George wants to take it on. Tony, do you okay. want to give it a shot? Actually, I think this is a, a case of the in, in, in reconciling cost estimate when we go through this. As the project evolves, we will have to do constant reviews on estimating. And I think if there are discrepancies, then we have to find a way to reconcile. Uh, the process of budgeting a project and estimating is always ongoing. And we, that's why we have the various phases in design. But I think I'm going to defer to some others in terms of both the construction side and maybe the financing side from the group. Canada, George? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll add to that. Tony's absolutely right. Typically, at each, we're gonna have several phases of the design left to go before we actually get to bid day where we're actually putting this out on the street. And at those times, there's gonna be two estimators at each of those phases that are gonna estimate this project, one from the owner's side and one from the design team side. And then we're gonna reconcile those costs. These estimators have a much, much deeper knowledge of the marketplace and are going to estimate this project accordingly. And at the, those various points in time, we're gonna make sure that there's value management in place to get us on budget before we move into the next phase and so on and so forth up until bid day. Um, that has historically been uh, proven as a, as a very 
uh, accurate way of doing uh, uh, this kind of uh, of effort and ensures that we get a bid that's that's um, that's on budget or under budget uh, come bid time. And Ken, just to be clear, can you just remind us what the contingencies are that are built into the budget? How much of a escalation or contingency do we have built into the budget? Yeah, so typically what we have is we have two, two forms of contingency carried within our total project budget. One is what's called the owner's project contingency, which are for uh, typically for soft costs uh, that may be extended, uh, professional services that need to be adjusted, uh, any additional furniture, fixtures, and equipment, typically owner costs, soft costs. Hard costs are typically covered under what we call the construction contingency. Uh, that would be used for any sort of uh, bid uh, fluctuations um, or also for any sort of changes that might happen in the field during construction. One of the things that we do as part of our, of our um, ensuring that we get a good bid value is we wanna make sure we have cost certainty at the time of bid. So we'll look to other avenues of potentially having alternates uh, as part of the project as well that we can accept certain alternates as they're coming on online as we to ensure that we get the project on budget. Can you just tell me what percentage you generally assign to each of those contingency areas? Yeah, typically it's it's five five percent each. Okay. All right. Uh, Dorothy Pam. Hi. Oh, this has been very interesting. And I want to go back to Doug Kelleher on the historic tax credits, just for one more question and then a question for Sean. Um, so I heard your answer to George. Um, I guess I want a firmer answer. Have you had experience with um, projects such as the library where nobody wanted to buy their historic tax credits? Because if you can convince me that this is really something that's gonna go, I will feel a lot more secure about one aspect of the financing. Doug. So I would say, um, no, we've never had an experience where there's been no one that was interested in purchasing the credits. Okay. Um, you know, typically uh, these credits are, are purchased by individuals or corporations who owe a lot of tax who have a lot of tax liability, insurance companies, banks, you know, large corporations. Um, and like I said, we've never had an instance where there's been no interest in purchasing the credits. Okay, well, thank you. And my second question is to Sean Mangano, and it's about option number two, where the town puts the money out first and then um, pays itself back when the grants come in and actually earns some money with interest if it comes in before you need it. That sounds like a great idea. Um, why is it just one of three options? Um, this is for Sean. So the, the reason why we're not moving forward with that option is a, is a definite. Is using certain assumptions, that option is less expensive than the option that was shown in the in the presentation, the downside of that option is we have to start making debt payments a couple of years sooner than we would under the other option. So it so the trade off with that option of using the grant money last and using the town money first is that the town would have to start making payments sooner. Um, so some of that's looking at the library project and how it fits in with the other four building projects mm -hmm. and the town deciding as a whole, you know, are we ready to start making debt payments for the library project as early as FY twenty two. Um, which is a big, that's, you know, that's a big question. And how flexible can you make up your mind as you see how things are going, or do you have to lock something in um, earlier? So we would, we would have to decide that relatively soon. Um, once the pro if the project is approved, we have to decide that because we would have to determine if we were going to go out for a bond um, in late FY21 or early FY22 to lock in an interest rate. Cause again, the major benefit of that route is locking in an interest rate wow. fairly soon. Um, mm -hmm. to, you know, prevent any increases in the future. Interest rates are really good right now. Um, you know, some between one and 2% for large scale projects. So um, that is a major benefit and something we're really looking at seriously. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Kathy. Um, I too thank you for the, both the presentation and the detail. I'm going to try to just build on a couple questions that were already asked, starting with the historic tax credits. Um, you you noted that 
uh, when you're applying to either be, be certified for them, um, you may have to apply multiple times to get the credit in the first place. How many groups apply and never get a credit? So you don't get that credit that you can sell to someone else is my question on the credit. So what share just never get it? Along with that is um, if, if we were to go a renovation and repair route, and would the repairs to the old part of the building also qualify for historic tax credits, um, you know, depending on how they're done. A lot, so that's just staying with historic tax credits. And then my unrelated question is to Bob Pam on endowment. Um, you talked a little bit about the risk to the endowment, and I think you said you could tolerate up to a $2 million draw on it if all failed. So what I'm seeing is, um, I'm, what I'm worried about is multiple risks to the operating budget and to our capital costs. So risks could be included, the project comes in at a higher cost than we estimate, fundraising doesn't raise as much, we don't get the historic tax credits, or we get them five years, six years from now. So the endowment is put at risk. And I'm worried if the endowment is put at risk, that the operating budget is put at risk. And I've been watching what's happening each time you come in for an operating budget. We've been cutting back on staff, converting full-time to part-time. So it's already really tight. And we need that endowment endowment draw every year. So the risk I see of the, the endowment is that it might have to absorb shortfalls. And then we build a new library and we can't open it. Or we can't open it for the hours because it's a shortfall the operating sides. So I'm, I'm going to stick with those two, and I don't know if that's me that's doing it, but I'll try to turn my mic off. I'm, those are my two. One is on tax credits, and the other's on endowment. Doug, do you want to start with the tax credits, please? Sure. So it sounded like that was a bit of a two-part question. So the first part being how many um, don't receive the credits. And really, the, the credits are um, awarded to projects that qualify. For the program so it really comes down to the proposed scope of work and basically that how is the historic building being treated as part of the project um in this case how is the new addition designed is it how does it you know complement how is it compatible with the historic building um, i would say at least the projects of which our office is familiar with um, and we do an awful lot of this um, work here in massachusetts very few of our projects um, have not received any credits. Um, and those projects have been ones where it, there are pretty dramatic reasons as to why they did not, for example, buildings were moved, buildings were disassembled and reconstructed. Um, but for the most part, um, you know, most projects, if the project design meets the Secretary of Interior standards, they're going to receive some form of, of tax credit allocation. How much you know they receive as far as in comparison to how much they're eligible will vary. Um, but again, they also take into certain con certain factors are taken into consideration as part of the decision as to which projects get the tax credits. Projects that have a lot of local support for them rank very high um, in the review process, so those tend to receive more um, credits. Um, I believe your other, the second part of that question was would the renovation option um, possibly qualify for those for the historic tax credits as well. Um, it could, it could very well, because again, the comes down to the work that's being done and how the historic building is, is, you know, being treated. Um, if the renovation option was such that it's also in compliance with the Secretary of Interior standards, it too could qualify for the tax credits. Thank you. Uh, I believe the other one we would like to direct to Bob Pam. Lynn, before Bob answers the question, I just want to be clear linguistically. <laughs> we have two options. One option is repair without renovation. The other option is a renovation and addition. So what Kuhn Riddle have presented to us does not renovate the building. It just deals with mechanical, electrical, and plumbing and with accessibility. So. In that sense, I think it's better to call that a repair option than a renovation option. Thank you. Um, Bob? <clears throat> okay, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. 
the question you're asking has to do with what is the level of risk. Um, and you know, what I've tried to do is model it by taking as many things going wrong as I could think of that were likely to go wrong. Um, you know, as of December, the, the value of the endowment was 9 million. It's now about 9.3 million. I don't know where the market will go, so I can't say that it'll be higher or lower. Um, but what I used was 8 million as, as the base from which I then did all calculations. Um, I then looked at the way in which uh, a reduction in the, the uh, endowment of $2 million would then affect that, um, our ability to take draws. Um, <clears throat> I looked at it in, in a couple of different ways, one having to do with um, how light, how long would it likely take us to raise the additional money to restore it to $8 million? And second, what would it mean if the amount of the market without any uh, additional contributions occurring, uh, what would happen if the market either was absolutely flat or went up by just 1% over our draw or 2% over our draw. Each of those was, I thought, a pretty conservative way of thinking about it. Um, when you do that and you work it out 10 years into the future, um, there were a couple of years in which it was of the order of 290,000 rather than 300,000. Um, but for the most part, it grew over that reasonably quickly and there were no, no periods of time when there would be um, such a reduction in operating uh, funds being provided to the library that we would not be able to function. So that was the way in which I thought about it. That was the way in which I calculated. It's the way I modeled it. Um, I can't tell you that there are no circumstances under which it would fail. Because um, I don't control the market, I don't control, you know, how fast people will will contribute money. Um, I don't. I can control to some degree how much we withdraw from the fund. And we have, uh, <clears throat> at the beginning of the 2010s, we were drawing it a year. Since then, there's one year in which we took five percent, and the rest of them have been four or four and a half percent. And so, you know, we have been pretty consistent over these years uh, in trying to follow what our policy is, which is to to keep it down to a sustainable rate. Would the town be at risk if we can't bear the risk? The town's risk is that the MBLC's requirement is that the library continue to function. Okay, if you are imagining that we will not have any money to run, then you know, there is some level of risk. Um, but it is not a huge risk, and it, you know I don't see that as being the likely issue that that you should think about. Thank you, uh, Darcy Dumont. Please unmute. And there you go. Um, okay. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Um, one is, and I just have to express a little bit of frustration because I feel like um, I would like to be asking questions about a, um, you know, a repair option of a, a, a retrofitted energy efficiency retrofitted repair, and that isn't a possibility um, because we don't have that the data on that. So um, I'm just saying that 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 is a frustration for me. Um, but I have a couple of questions. Um, one is, I think, for the architect about um, the EUI and the net zero readiness. And um, the other one is for the trustees about the operating budgets. 
So um, I, um, my question about the EUI is, is the EUI of 29 and the net zero readiness um, projected to be for the whole building, including the, the new and old portions of the final building or just for the new addition? And if it's only for the addition, then is there a uh, calculated averaged EUI and projected energy usage for the whole combined project? Um, uh, and the second question is, um, I know there's been some discussion recently at the JCPC that um, the library is at least making some suggestion that um, the branch libraries should maybe pick up the operating expenses for staffing. And I'm wondering if the library could commit to not reducing their commitment to the branch branches operating budgets in order to complete this project. So on the EUI, um, Austin, do you want Alex to do that or is that an architect? Uh, Alex seems, I, Alex is nodding. I don't know whether she's nodding that she doesn't want to do it. She's nodding no. Tony, I think she's nodding no. So if you could answer that question, Alex would feel 100% better. Okay, um, this one I'm actually going to have to a little bit um, heavier because I think when we did the EUI analysis and we're confirming all of this, this was done with the entire building in consideration. It's the calculations as we put forth all of the detailed uh, investigation. So it is not just a new addition, it includes the existing. And of course, you know, the existing building yeah, by comparison to the new has a different set of um, assumptions because of the fact that you're operating under different construction at the dollars, but it was predicated on the entire building, not just in part. So does that assume that the, um, the does that imply that the repair option would also be able to have a significant, significant thermal improvements then? If that's incorporated into the <clears throat> whole building plan? Any question regarding are you talking about the repair or the renovation of the existing building that goes with the renovation and expansion? Or are you talking about the repair option? I'm, I'm, <clears throat> I'm saying that if the EUI is 29, including the existing building portion of it, then that means there's significant renovation and upgrading of energy efficiency for the existing building in order to do that. Is that correct? Tony? I, I'm not in the position to answer on the existing building just by itself. That, that analysis, again, was not broken out that way. It was done with the understanding of analyzing the project as a whole. But Darcy, I think the answer to your question is what we were asked to do is what we did, which is we got a, a town council asked us to get the cost for repair and dealing with the state, state and federal requirements on accessibility. That is what we've done. Yeah, if the town council, sorry, Lynn, if the town council would want us to go back and get an estimate of what it would cost to make the existing building, just the existing building, more energy efficient, we could do that. What is certain is that it would su substantially raise the cost that is now associated with the repair option. Yeah, I guess what I'm asking is whether you could provide the details of your calculation of how you came up with the EUI of 29, including the existing building. I believe that, I mean, Darcy, I, I don't want to put words in Darcy's mouth, but what she is asking is, 
will there be things done in the renovation of the existing part of the building that will lead, contribute to the reduced EUI? I believe the answer to that question is yes. Okay. I, I assumed it was, but that, okay. Um, and then uh, Darcy, you had a second one, which was directed to the trustees on the operating of the budget, the operating budget and the quote rumor or whatever out there that the needed staff position would come from the branch libraries. So I'm gonna ask the library director to respond to this, Sharon. Yeah, hi everybody. Uh, so no, um, what, so this, uh, this question about staffing and, and utilities uh, doesn't have to do with the Munson branch. It has to do with the North Amherst branch. And specifically the concerns are having to do with the expanded size of it. So um, what, what I have said to Paul and what is going on in JCPC is we absolutely will continue to maintain staffing levels at the North Amherst Library for the library portion, but we're, we're not able to pay the added utilities costs. We cannot oversee uh, the, the rental of that meeting room space, that's gonna be up to the town. So, so yes, um, with an expanded Jones Library, that's not gonna affect the staffing at the North Amherst Library. Does that make sense? Darcy, does that get to your question? Is that is that a change in policy? I don't know what change in policy you're referring to. No, what we're saying is the staffing at the North Amherst Library isn't going to change. It, we're not going to add staff. I can't afford to add staff at the North Amherst Library once it gets bigger due to an additional meeting room. Is that more clear? So you can't commit to <clears throat> you can't commit to um, completely staffing the expanded North Amherst Library. We are not going to take on the meeting room as a library expense. Correct. That is that's a it's a town building and that's a town function. The town will be renting out that that meeting room. And so it's up to the town to take care of those costs. OK, thank you. OK, um, Mandy Jo. Thank you. Um, I think I, I don't have too many questions. Um, I do want to comment on the historic tax credits that it sounds very similar to the um, low income housing tax credits, both at the federal and state level that I just learned about in a training I went to in terms of when you can apply, how often you apply and all of that. And those are important um, financing sources for nonprofits to finance low income housing in in buildings throughout. So that actually eased a lot of my concern about historic tax credits to hear. There's very similar programs for affordable housing that seem to operate similarly. Um, a question on the 8% savings on, on the electricity generated. Um, did that include subtracting the electricity that will be generated by the solar panels from the total electricity use in the building? Um, I think I'm trying to, I, think I've worded that right. In other words, that 8% savings, does that include the savings you'll get from sort of producing your own energy too? Or would that even lower the operational costs even more? Um, and then I, I think I just wanted to clear up, I think something that Darcy was trying to get at, the repair only options. Those don't include in general, any energy efficient improvements that would result in any significant reduction of EUI for the building as it exists today. Is that correct? That is correct. I want to add, however, it doesn't mean you wouldn't buy a more efficient furnace. It just means it wasn't factored in to um, give you an EUI change. Uh, but I want to go back to Mandy Joe's first question. And uh, it's regarding what was, how was the solar calculated into the savings? Let me see if I can, you, you had an estimated use of kilowatt hours. 
-hmm. did you subtract from that estimated use because then you multiplied that by a price per kilowatt hour did you subtract from that estimated kilowatt hours the estimated amount that the solar panels will produce on the building uh, because you won't that's a sunk cost at that point you're not paying for them additionally so i'm trying to figure out whether that eight percent includes or whether it's actually going to be an even higher reduction because right. you have to subtract out the kilowatt hours produced by solar. Austin, you're muted. Alex is nodding affirmatively that she would like to answer the question. Way to go, <laughs> Alex. No, Alex was going to look to Ken because I think Ken, didn't your group generate that number? And I, I know that the the text says that it includes all the ECMs, but I don't know if you guys projected solar costs as part of the ECM. So I can might be better. Yeah, I believe and, that's exactly what, what it was. Yep. It it calculated yep. those in as part of the as part of the savings. With including the solar or not including the solar? Including the solar, I believe. Okay. And when the finance committee looks at the details, we can ask some more questions about that. Shalini? Yeah, I have a couple of questions, but before that, I want to acknowledge what a thoughtful process this has been and just want to thank everyone in this room for all the work you've done and, and all the people who are not in the room and have been doing this work since 2011. So I learned a lot in this process and I just want to encourage um, all the residents listening and, and beyond that the report that you provided you know, really provided a lot of information and helped me understand. And I want to thank the community that's been sending us so many good questions. And um, so, I mean, I just want to share one thing that was, that really stood out for me, and then I'll get to the question, is that, um, you know, we think about why is this costing so much? And why can't we just re rearrange the space, for example? And I learned that you actually hired a mass library system to do the space planning. And so it's, you know, there's a reason why it's being done. Another question we had was, Hadley did this in $8.2 million and they have a great library. Why can't we do something? And what I learned was that libraries, the Hadley library serves 19,000 people in a year. And does anyone know how many, if you read the report, you'd know, uh, we serve 227,000 people. So we are a regional, regional library. And yeah, I think um, everything that I'm hearing from Climate Action Goals to all, it seems like there's a lot of thought that's been put through. And, and so thank you. The questions are, um, one is, I might have missed this answer, but I'm, I'm still not very clear about the question that was asked earlier about the cost. How is it that the cost of repairs is more than the cost of constructing a new? So if someone could just run the numbers again, maybe Sean. And the second question was more speaking uh, as a business owner downtown, that will the library be having meeting spaces for renting so we can offer it like i know that when i didn't have a studio it was so hard to find space affordable space downtown to offer uh workshops for the community and uh so will there be meeting spaces flexible spaces you know from 10 people to maybe 50 people spaces thank you um Austin, who would you like to deal with the first one, which is the question of comparing the cost? I think our distinguished uh, pound finance director is the appropriate person. Got it, Sean. I'm not known for that, but I appreciate it. So, um, so the repair option one, based on the, the timing and the assumptions in repair option one was more expensive than the renovation and addition option. And the reason is a repair option one cost more, it was 16.8 million um, to the town in total. Again, that's not accounting for any potential offsets. So I'll be fully clear on that piece of it. Um, whereas the repair or the, the renovation and addition option, the net cost of the town was 15.8. So, so in total dollars net to the town, it was less expensive. And then the other piece of that is repair option one 
is over a much longer period of time and the the big borrowing associated with repair option one wouldn't be until I think it was 2026 or 2027 when that last phase happens. And so for things that happen that far in the future, a higher interest rate is assumed. Um, and so for a, a big portion of that with a higher interest rate, the the total cost when you add up all the, the payments, um, it just ends up being higher. And so in other words, mm -hmm. you would be taking out um, loans or you would be borrowing as you go into each phase. So you wouldn't secure all the money at once. Sean, you're muted. So when you borrow money, you have to spend that money within a certain period of time. So when you look at that particular option, you'll see that there's um, three bond anticipation notes, which is what you would use to uh, pay for the construction while it's happening. And then at the end of each of those bond anticipation notes, you would con convert it to a long-term bond. So you'll see three bonds as well. And so that's to line up with those three phases of that repair option. Okay. Um, and there was a second question, which really goes to the trustees and to Sharon, and that would be uh, renting meeting space. Sharon. Yeah, hi. Um, okay, so that's a really cool question. Um, so there will we'll still have the Woodbury room and that space will definitely be available uh, after hours, which will be great. We'll still have the Amherst room. I'm not sure that that space will be available after hours, but certainly it will be usable by the public. We're also gonna have uh, the boardroom, the Goodwin room, uh, which will be usable by the public once we expand and renovate. Um, the, the benefit of expanding is because we will also have kid spaces, a teen space and, and, and spaces for ESL and special collections, then when the public needs to reserve meeting rooms, they won't have to compete with staffing, staff programs that are going on. So there will be greater availability for those kinds of rooms. Thank you for asking. Uh, thanks, Alex, you have your hand up. So I'm going to assume you might have a comment you'd like to make. Yeah, so I, I just wanted to follow up on the EUI question and, and we'll definitely circle back in terms of what the actual numbers are on each part of the building. That's that's too down deep in the weeds for my memory in terms of the report. But what I did want to talk about is um, an EUI of 29 for a library is, is, is pretty spectacular because if you think about the number of computers, how long the lights are on, the AC that we run, so the average EUI in a library is 72, as I said, nationally. Athol, when they did their renovation and addition, was a LEED Platinum certified um, and got to 40. So the difference between our base project that they came back with at sustainability was an EUI of 34. And then with the additional cost, with the additional uh, energy conservation measures, we got it down to 29%. And just that 34 to 29% reduced our energy use by 15%. So like 40 for a library is spectacular. So I'm not an architect. I have no idea what that means in terms of what we could do for the current building. But I just want to be clear that 29 is a is phenomenal for a library. So libraries are one of the biggest energy hogs when you look, so you can actually look up online um, all of the different energy use um, intensity for different types of buildings, public buildings, schools, libraries, and libraries are notoriously the biggest energy hog. So I just want to give that piece of information, but definitely um, Councilor Dumont will come back and give you the specifics for each part of the building. Uh, Kathy, I know you've had a question before and I just want to reiterate that this is going to the finance committee. We've now spent an um, hour and 50 minutes on this. And so I want to just ask, is your question one that has to be answered tonight or can it go to the finance committee? It can, it can go to the finance. I just want to um, ask that people that you double check the cents per hour use and the kilowatt hours on that energy table. Because it's it when I did it, it might have done it too fast. It looked like a higher sense per hour was for current than for uh, the expansion. So just just double check the math was my my only my only comment. It's a question also. Thanks. I, I do want to mention that I have several questions that are financial in nature, and I will save them for the finance committee. Are there any other questions from the council? I want to reiterate to the audience that we have 
two public forums dedicated strictly to this topic. One is on the 3rd at 6 o'clock, 3rd of March. The other is on the 6th at 2 o'clock. Uh, they are meetings of the council. As many councillors that can be there will be there. And I also want to thank the library for and the trustees and all of your consultants for this extremely thorough kicking off of this public conversation. We're at the beginning. Uh, you provided a strong base of information for us to go forward with, and we look forward to our ongoing conversations. With that, I'm going to say we're going to have a 10 minute break and we will reconvene at nine o'clock. Uh, Lynn, would you like to give us the chance to adjourn our meeting? Oh, please do. Um, <laughs> otherwise, we'll have to stay. So I, I think we. Yeah, I'd like you to adjourn the meeting. Go okay. Ahead. So uh, is there is there a motion to adjourn the meeting of the Library Board of Trustees? So moved. Uh, Second. Good. Fabulous. Okay. So I'm not going to call your name, and if you would just please indicate whether or not you support adjourning. Alex. Yes. Chris. Yeah. Tammy Ely. Yes. Bob Pam. Adjourned. <laughs> Lee, Lee Edwards. Okay. Uh, Austin Sarrett. So the meeting is adjourned. Lynn, before you take your break, I want to thank the council uh, for hearing us out. I want to thank the council for its very good questions and say how much we look forward to continuing the conversation this spring. So thank you very much. Thank you. We'll thank you very much. Thank you as well. Appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank uh, you. Council, bye -bye. Please mute and also turn your video off. And we'll see you at nine o'clock. Dorothy Pam. I come back and check. Evan Ross. Present. George Ryan. Present. Kathy Shane. I'll come back and check. Steve Schreiber. Here. Andy Steinberg. Present. Dorothy Pam. Present. And Kathy Shane. Okay. We need to finish up uh, one item on the library, and that is a motion, which I will make at this point. It's to refer the Jones Library presentation and all accompanying documents and reference documents to the Finance Committee to review the financial elements of each option and report that review to the Town Council for consideration at their meeting on Monday, April 5th, 2021. Is there a second? Second, Haneke. Thank you. Any further discussion? Okay, seeing none, then I'm going to bring that to a vote. And I will start with uh, Alyssa Brewer. Aye. DeAngelis. Aye. DeMont. Yes. Commissioners and I. Haneke. Aye. Pam. Aye. Kevin Ross. Aye. Brian. Yes. Jane. I apologize. I came in the room late. What are we voting on? On the referral to the Finance Committee. Aye. Uh, yes. Schreiber. Yes. Steinberg. Yes. Schwartz. Aye. And Balmil. Yes. Okay, that's unanimous. Uh, we're going to move on to the consent agenda. If we could just show the consent agenda on the screen. The following items were selected because they were considered to be routine and reasonable to expect that they would pass with no controversy to remove an item. Let me know that as I read it. And the request to remove an item does not require a second. The motion is to move the following items and printed and the printed materials there under and approve those items as a single unit. 8A1, adoption to amendments to town council rules or procedure rules 2.1, 4.3, 5.7, 8.1, 4.3, 5.7, 8.1, 4.3, 5.7, 
and the addition of Appendix B. Um, I, I'll come back, Dorothy, in a moment. Approval of town manager appointments for the town clerk and approval of minutes for the January 20th, 2021 special town council meeting minutes, joint meeting with planning board, January 25th, 2021 regular town council meeting minutes and February 8th, 2021 regular town council meeting minutes. Dorothy, you have your hand up. Please unmute. Right. So that means that we're 6.3 is not included in this vote. Is that correct? That is correct. These okay. are ones that people had no questions about or um, it was minor, you know, editorials. Okay. Okay. I, I did you ever explain 9.5? Oh, yeah. I said, okay, because I couldn't figure out why there was a difference between 10 and 9. Yeah, I couldn't figure out what math that would be because nine is two thirds. So what's above two thirds? Nine is two thirds, yes. Yes, so what? why 10? There is one, a requirement for the super majority. Would you like to pull that one out? Oh, okay, so there's something, I didn't know there was something called super majority. I, I could explain two -thirds. Two -thirds. Okay. Okay. Mandy Jo, go ahead. Yeah, so prior to the change in the law, there was a that provision that that same line that says upon a protest for zoning bylaws mm -hmm. required 10 votes um, actually required a 75 three quarter percent majority three oh. quarters. Um, but when they changed the law, they moved that down to two thirds instead of 75 percent. Okay. All right. So this, this brings it consistent with the law. Okay. Right. So we're leaving it on the consent agenda. It's uh -huh. Second to the consent agenda uh, motion. Ryan, second. Thank you. Uh, any further discussion or questions? Okay, then we'll start with Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Darcy DeMont. Yes. Reesmers, aye. Haneke. Aye. Pam. Aye. Ross. Aye. Brian? Yes. Shane? Yes. Driver? Yes. Steinberg? Yes. Schwartz? Aye. Balnilm? Yes. Brewer? Aye. Thank you. Okay. We do not have any resolutions and proclamations tonight. And we are now going to move to the update on the zoning priorities and work plan. Um, same as before with regard to this, I will call after the presentation, I will call on counselors and ask that they limit to your top question or two. And if more questions, we can always collect them later, uh, unless it's obvious as to whom we would direct a question to, I will direct it to David. Um, and if we have more questions, as I mentioned before, we will uh, do that. We are not taking a vote tonight. I'm going to be very clear. No vote. All right. Uh, we have ta Assistant Town Manager Dave Zomack, Planning Director Christine Brestrup, and Building Commissioner Rob Mora. Lynn, I didn't see Dave's um, name on the roster. Okay, let me check. I may be mistaken that he would be here, but that's, I just please proceed unless you were expecting him. I wasn't expecting him, may I, may I begin? Please, please do. I'm sorry that I made that mistake. Good evening, um, my name is Christine Brestrup and I'm the planning director. And Building Commissioner Rob Mora and I would like to present our work plan for working on the uh, for, pre for preparing zoning amendments for consideration by Town Council later this spring. A shorter version of this work plan was presented at a joint meeting of the Planning Board and the CRC on February 9th. So some of you will recognize some of the slides. Um, next slide, please. 
As you'll remember, on January 4th, 2021, Town Council voted to direct the Town Manager to present zoning amendments to the Town Council. The zoning amendments were divided into two groups and assigned due dates, and we've been calling them Phase 1 and Phase 2. The Building Commissioner has been working with the Planning Department, and we assess the list, and we've developed a work plan to achieve the stated goals. Uh, so we're now ready to present our work plan. Next slide, please. Um, the phase one of these goals was um, set forth by the town council as um, zoning amendments that they hoped would be presented to uh, this, them in March. Um, so I'll go through that list. Uh, one of the first one is adding the BL limited business district to footnote B. Second one is adding footnote A to maximum lot coverage and maximum building coverage. Just to let people in the audience know, these footnotes have to do with dimensional requirements that are listed in the dimensional table in the zoning bylaw. Um, the third one is to revise the supplemental dwelling unit uh, bylaw to allow um, it to be uh, the dwelling unit to be larger. The fourth one is to um, revise the demolition delay bylaw, which has to do with the historical commission's ability to um, uh, impose um, demolition delays on buildings that are proposed for demolition. Um, the, the fifth one is um, working with the council to begin work on housing types and expansion of housing types. And housing types, just to give you a, a sense of what that is, single family housing, to duplexes, triplexes. Um, some towns have what they call quadruplexes. And then we have multifamily housing in the form of apartments and um, mixed use buildings. Um, the next one was to move apartments from site plan review by the planning board, um, to move apartments to site plan review by the planning board instead of being uh, having them be required to go through the special permit process with the zoning board of appeals. Uh, the next one is to remove footnote M and footnote M has to do with additional lot area that's required for um, townhouses and apartments in the RG zoning district. And the next one is to revise the apartments definition. May I have the next slide, please? So <clears throat> the second group of town council priorities, which we were to present to town council, I believe it was September, include um, looking at the dimensional regulations in the RG, that is general residence, and RVC, residential village center districts. Um, next one is lowering barriers to development of duplexes and triplexes. In other words, to allow them to be um, permitted in more places than they currently are. The next one is frontage regulations for residential districts. Sometimes particular lots aren't allowed to be developed because they don't have adequate frontage, even though they may have adequate lot area. The next one is to look at appropriate uses for village centers. And this is something that was brought up because if we're going to be adding dwelling units to village centers, it makes sense to think about allowing certain commercial and retail uses that might be um, useful to people who are living there. The next one is transportation issues, which isn't necessarily something that would be a zoning issue, but there may be aspects of transportation that have to do with zoning. And the, the final one that we've listed here, although it's certainly not final in our minds, is um, hiring a consultant to help us to develop design guidelines. May I have the next slide, please? So I'm gonna turn this over to Rob Mara now to uh, talk a little more about what we're um, doing here. Uh, hi, this is Rob Mora, Building Commissioner. Uh, so we had a long list uh, that Christine just reviewed of uh, priorities that came from the council. And uh, we also had priorities that were established by the planning department. Uh, with the uh, goal of uh, having amendment proposals uh, pretty well drafted this spring uh, with a possibility of consideration uh, summertime. If we could have the next slide, please. Uh, you can see here uh, the list of items we chose to include in the phase one work plan. Uh, some of those items came from the town council list, as I mentioned, and some uh, also came from the planning department list. We'll talk about each of these a, a little bit more in the following slides. Uh, if we go up to the next slide, please. Uh, one of the items is the uh, BL district uh, with the, the focus and goal of how to, how to build more housing in the BL. Um, 
we decided to focus on two specific areas of the BL uh, in the downtown area, north of Triangle Street and west of North Pleasant Street at this time. Uh, we looked at a several options. Uh, you know, the, the uh, initial recommendation was to add the BL district to footnote B. We did look at that, in fact, found that we don't think that is the desirable way to move forward. And we'll be able to talk more about that uh, in, in upcoming meetings. Uh, another option was to create an overlay. Uh, this would uh, designate a, a more specifically the area that we want to see development and incorporate design standards in those areas. That actually is the uh, the concept that we are moving ahead with in more detail and we'll be uh, continuing to talk about in the coming weeks. Uh, we also looked at another option of creating uh, an entirely new zoning district with those BL locations, uh, but chose uh, not to move forward with that option at this time. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the other, uh, another item we're working on is the removal of footnote M in the RG district. Now footnote M is the uh, piece of the dimensional tables in our bylaw that establishes an additional lot area for each additional dwelling unit that's pro uh, proposed for an apartment or a townhouse, uh, again, in the RG district only. Uh, we have been studying this uh, in great detail. Uh, both staff and the planning board has uh, done quite a bit of work uh, on this uh, proposed amendment over the last few weeks. Uh, we are uh, continuing to talk about this with the planning board this Wednesday and working our way to uh, some good recommendations for uh, the proposed amendment to, to move forward. Uh, next slide, please. And I'll pass this back to Chris. Chris, you're muted. Chris, you, yeah. I had a whole group of sentences that I just said, excuse me. Um, the supplemental dwelling units have to do with small dwelling units that are allowed in conjunction with single family houses in all of the residential zoning districts, except for the fraternity residents. Um, we'd like to look at increasing the maximum size of these dwelling units from 800 square feet, which is currently allowed to 1,000 square feet. This was proposed back in 2018 and town meeting uh, came very close to passing it. Um, we're, go we're analyzing whether the size of the supplemental dwelling unit should relate to the size of the existing house. Um, and we're an analyzing what, what dimensional requirements should apply to supplemental dwelling units like height and setback, et cetera. And we're finding examples of existing supplemental dwelling units in town and researching how other towns handle supplemental dwelling units. Next slide, please. Um, we're also looking at the apartment definition. Currently, the definition of apartments states that um, you can't have more than 24 dwelling units in, a, in an apartment building. And it states that um, no more than 50% of the units in a building can be of any one type. And by that, we mean um, any one bedroom type. In other words, uh, single family, or excuse me, single bedroom, duplex, or <laughs> two bedroom, um, studio, or three bedroom. So no, no more than 50% can be of any one size of apartment. Um, we're considering whether we should divide apartments into class one and class two apartments where class one would be 25 units or less and class two would be 25 units or more. And we realize that design standards are very important as well. Next slide, please. Um, I think okay. Rob is taking this yep. one. Yep, so uh, we are looking at the mixed use building standards at this time, uh, particularly because of the uh, proposed, uh, potential proposed changes to the BL district, we feel it's, uh, a necessary time to take a look at this uh, this section of the bylaw. As you may know, the mixed use building uh, is not defined currently. It does not establish a uh, certain amount of non-residential space in, in a building. It doesn't uh, provide any other standard for uh, types of units or mix. And it doesn't uh, uh, factor in uh, the amount of parking that would be allowed on the ground floor as part of that non-residential use. Uh, so we feel that's important to work on at this time. Uh, next slide, please. 
Uh, similarly, we are uh, looking at the inclusionary zoning bylaw and feel it's a, a, an appropriate time to bring forward an idea to um, incorporate the inclusionary zoning provisions for all developments uh, with, with the exception of a, a standard subdivision. Uh, but for all units that uh, have 10 or more units associated with them, uh, we think this is a good time to propose an amendment. And we'll be talking about this with the planning board in the coming weeks as well. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, along with this, uh, we are working on the recodification uh, that uh, for the most part includes reformatting the bylaw, uh, making minor corrections uh, and adjustments and uh, adding definitions and uh, clarifications to interpretations. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so here's our schedule. Uh, you can see we're, we're a few weeks into the work plan uh, with this meeting here tonight. Uh, tomorrow we review uh, in more detail uh, a few of these items that we've made uh, quite a bit of progress on over the last few weeks with the CRC uh, tomorrow uh, at their regular meeting. Uh, we'll be continuing to work with the planning board and uh, which is now the planning board zoning subcommittee combined uh, over the next couple of weeks with the goal of bringing proposed amendments, uh, as many of these as we can have ready uh, for the March 9th meeting, uh, anticipating that the CRC will then decide uh, how to uh, conduct their public process uh, and, and work on uh, understanding the amendments and uh, ultimately deciding when and, and how to uh, bring those to the council for uh, consideration to start the uh, formal hearing process on any amendments that are chosen to move forward. Uh, I think that concludes our uh, update at this time. Uh, happy to answer questions. Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to um, thank the staff and uh, CRC for all of the time you've been putting in, but also uh, the planning board as well, because there's been clearly a lot of thought has gone into what you're presenting to us. Uh, we're going to start with questions again, uh, George Ryan. Yeah, thank you, Lynn. Uh, two questions, if I may, uh, both fairly brief. I'm curious about the inclusionary zoning bylaw that you're thinking about. Is that something that you are considering also for what I consider the workforce housing component, in other words, 80 to 120 percent AMI, can inclusionary zoning uh, embrace that? Um, that's the first question. The second is somewhat wistful, I guess. Whatever happened to 40? Uh, Would you like me to answer those questions? Please. So in terms of inclusionary zoning, I think we're really sticking to um, 80% or less of AMI for now. It's a complicated enough um, topic to deal with. And um, the units that are 80% or less of area median income are the ones that are counted on the supplemental housing inventory, which is the list that the state keeps. And, and that's something that we, um, we wanna make sure that we keep our numbers up on that. Um, but we'd certainly be willing to consider 80 to 120 percent at some future time. Um, and Chapter 40R is, um, I would say it's on the back burner right now um, because of the focus of the planning board and planning department on these zoning amendments that we've been tasked with um, developing. Um, we just didn't have enough bandwidth currently to work on 40R as well. Um, but we are, um, you know, very interested in the possibility of um, developing 40R, particularly for um, village centers, where we think it might actually be um, at the best, best location. Um, be before I go on to the next question, I'm gonna pause for a moment, and ask Mandy Joe whether CRC has any particular comments at this time? Uh, no particular comments. Just thank you to Chris and Rob and frankly, the entire planning staff for all the hard work they've been doing. We're going to get more updates tomorrow and they've they've really been on top of everything and and working hard to to, you know, get us what we asked for and and get us something that meets that. And so we're really appreciative to the entire planning staff for that. Thank you. Man. I think we all appreciate 
with the enormous amount of effort. Dorothy, you have your hand up. So oh, I just wanted to clarify in case somebody was watching this who hadn't been following it. Um, and you can tell from the presentation that um, we did not uh, we did not say this is what we want make it happen i believe the town council said look at these things and see how they work and that's what the planning board and the planning staff have been doing and um i mean i have to agree with mandy joe tremendous work reports research um a lot of stuff coming out and we're getting some really interesting uh results on this so um i think it's an it's an exciting time um and I think that we're gonna have a chance to have a lot of things to talk about. Great, Darcy. Yeah, I wanted to say that I uh, appreciated uh, seeing the planning staff list with the inclusionary zoning at the top of the list and sort of reflecting some of the issues that have been brought up before. Um, and uh, so I have a couple of questions. One. It, uh, is, um, um, has there been any studying of, um, who we're targeting to live in the BL district, um, and whether residents want addition, you know, additional housing in the BL. Um, so I'm just interested about that. Like, who do we think is going to live there? If we put a bunch of apartments there. Okay. That's one question. Um, then another question is, um, uh, I guess I'm a little confused about the process with CRC and the planning board and how, you know, what is actually required under the charter. Feels, it feels very entwined and, if, and like the planning board isn't getting to um, fulfill its fu function as a resident committee because we're, we're you know, butting in, <laughs> that's what it feels like to me. And so I'm wondering um, how that how that all is going to work with going back and forth with the planning board. Um, and lastly, I just wondered if, um, if we have a plan about figuring out which one of all of these different items uh, does not require a two thirds vote to pass with the council those three questions. Okay. Um, do you want me to answer those questions? Please sure. try, try to answer those questions. Um, the first one, I don't think we have an answer for that. I think that, um, you know, we had um, a housing market study done that was produced in 2015, and it showed that many different types of people wanted to live in Amherst. And so I don't feel like we can really be um, discriminatory about who might want to live in the BL, but I think a lot of people would like to live there because it's close to services, it's close to the university and Amherst, Amherst College, and it's close to um, transportation. So um, it's a very um, desirable area to live in. And, um, but I don't feel like we know exactly who's gonna live there. I don't think we can say absolutely no students if that's kind of the direction that the question was going in. Um, there probably will be students there, but there will be other people as well. So that would be my answer to that question. Um, as far as the process between the CRC and the planning board, um, the planning board is actually doing a great job right now of kind of being a sounding board for these zoning proposals. We have um, robust conversations at the planning board and Many members of the public are there and chime in and give um, their opinions about things and ask questions. So I think the planning board is fulfilling its uh, role. Um, the actual role that is um, determined by the state for the planning board is that they hold a public hearing on whatever zoning amendments are proposed. So there isn't, um, other than holding a public hearing, there isn't really a formal 
formal role for the planning board. In the past, they've been the entity that has um, sort of uh, come up with zoning amendments, but in this case, um, it's kind of together, the planning board and the, and the town council came up with a list. And so we're, we're working on all of those things. And um, so that, that would be my answer to that. And then um, which one doesn't require a two thirds vote? I don't think we absolutely know that yet. Um, there was a proposal for accessory dwelling units up to 900 square feet um, as part of the state law, the state package that just passed. And if the town chose to go that route, we would be able to adopt um, an accessory dwelling unit uh, bylaw. But we felt that we really wanted the extra 100 square feet to add an extra bedroom. And so that's the direction that we're going in right now. Um, so that wouldn't be um, able to be um, voted in by, uh, by a majority. It would need two thirds. Mm -hmm. Uh, Steve Schreiber. Yeah, just uh, this is a question that came up yesterday from a friend of mine who's on a planning board in another town. Um, how do we deal if inclusionary zoning includes all housing with a certain number of units or more? How do we deal with intentional housing like co-housing, where basically the residents are are determined not through a lottery but through some other method? And I'm just you don't have to answer that. I'm just Curious if you've thought about that. That's a good question. We haven't discussed it yet, but thank you for that question. All right, Kathy Shane. Hi, um, I also wanna applaud the direction you're going. You know, I, I made that comment um, earlier. And, and my question is, as you starting to think of um, design standards, and you mentioned at the CRC meeting, Chris, including thinking about what's the streetscape look like, you know, and the nature of the sidewalks and are there trees and is there a green strip? Um, are you or could you begin to think of putting some drawings into our zoning code to start to provide images and have this be the beginning? Um, and I um, I was looking under, um, you know, smart growth kinds of examples in Aurora, Colorado has a lot of a street this wide, a street this wide, setbacks relative to the street, sidewalks, and there were just drawings that gave you a really good sense of um, uh, it was in two dimension, but um, at least two dimension was better than none. So that was one, you know, could this be beginning of it? And when you come back to us, could some of this be done in 3D, even if it's in small sections? So we would get a sense of the potential mass um, that would be coming into a BL and or an RG if you end up uh, making changes in RG. And I realize you can't do it for every single lot, but could there be some discrete that you could mock those up? So I think we are um, intending to include drawings into our new zoning bylaw. Um, we haven't we haven't done that yet, but we're certainly intending to make that part of the bylaw because it helps people to understand what's being required. And in terms of 3D, um, we have acquired something called SketchUp for people in our department to work with um, to create 3D drawings. It's um, something that will allow us to show you massing and size. Um, it may not be, uh, it, it takes a lot of time to do detailed drawings of specific buildings with, you know, facade designs, et cetera, but um, we can certainly give you an idea of massing in some areas and on some properties. Thank you. Alyssa? I was just going to follow up on something that Darcy and Chris were talking about in regards to the role of the planning board and the CRC, because right, well, this is different than it used to be and new form of government. And just as she indicated that under state law, the planning board has a hearing. And of course, as we also know, because we've seen all kinds of wonderful flow charts about it, is that the CRC is having a hearing with the planning board to so as not to just have like duplicate hearings. But the other thing under state law is that they still write a planning board report and it's entirely possible that the planning board could have a completely different view of the eventual bylaw than the CRC does. So they could 
actually have competing views of a particular bylaw by the time it gets down to the actual wording of the bylaw based on the hearings they've held, based on the discussions they've had. So I don't feel like this does cut planning board out of the situation. It makes part of it more efficient. It makes part of it more of an ongoing conversation. And they still get their shot at saying, boy, this turned out to be a terrible idea, or this is wonderful. And CRC has their own separate opinion. All right. I see no other hands. And this was a discussion item only. So we're going to go on to the action items. And um, given the time, I am actually going to move the discussion on rule 6.3 E to another meeting at the same time that we will do 6.3 D, which has been referred back to GOL uh, with some language changes. So that brings us to the amendments to the town council's policy regarding the control and regulation of the public way. This is a first discussion. And uh, so we have a slide. Yes, Mr. Bachman. I assume that you're that you're that Chris and Rob can take off. Yes, they can. Thank you so much, both of you, for all the hard work. And please extend that thank you to the full planning staff. Thank you. Great. I'm sorry about that. Thanks, Paul. Okay, so um, we have a red line version on this that Athena is showing us, and I'm going to call on Darcy for the town services out and. TSO report, and then also George for GOL. Okay. <clears throat> um, the town manager uh, presented a proposed, proposed changes to the public way policy um, in an effort to ascertain what items need town council approval and which ones can be delegated to the town manager. <clears throat> I'm not sure what's wrong with my voice. Um, TSO agreed that um, routine maintenance doesn't need to need council approval. Um, uh, and as you can see, and as reported in the TSO report to the town council, um, the TSO recommends the changes in the red line version, the most substantive of, substantive of which are in section three. Um, interestingly, TSO did some reorganizing and clarifying, which should have been done by the GOL, and the GOL made a substantive change, which should have been done by the TSO. <laughs> but it all came out in the wash, as they say. Um, so um, let me just see what we're doing here. Oh, I order. Uh Lynn, could we have a wider version so we can see the document on the screen better? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah thanks. Ah, uh, yes. And could you scroll? Uh, yeah, we mainly are looking at number three here. Everything else is um, just um, grammatical and so on. If you can scroll up a little bit. Um, so, the main thing that we did is this uh, is D and E and F. So um, for placement of road and temporary signs, um, we delegated to the town manager placement of signs that relate to the control of the public way, crosswalks, speed limits, yield stop signs, et cetera, and placement of movable signs not covered by the general or zoning bylaw. Um, and um, then we, as town council, kept the authority over other requests for permanent changes to the public way that are listed in E, including some new items that we put in. Um, so all permanent changes to roads and sidewalks, including placement of utility structures, bus shelters, benches, permanent signs, electric vehicle and other charging stations, bike share stations, uh, the additional removal of crosswalks, um, major roadway and sidewalk redesign, such as um, the West Pomeroy project, um, and other public way requests relating to roads, as opposed to the parking or commons, not detailed above. 
but exempting maintenance and repairs conducted in the normal course of business. GOL, put that sentence in. So if you scroll down to F, um, we also, this, this was already in the policy acceptance of public ways. Um, town council remains keeper of the public way and that is where a private way uh, becomes a public way, is, is accepted as a public way, um, if I'm explaining that correctly. So that is basically what we did, or what we what we we're recommending to the council. George might have something to add. George, not not really. Um, we did insert that one phrase, which we took actually from uh, a section up above. Um, we felt that it wasn't a substantive change, um, but we thought it was uh, a little bit clearer. And other than that. Uh, we just uh, changed a few uh, of the bits of formatting, but the language stayed the same. Okay. Um, questions, Dorothy. I'm confused by the additional removal of a crosswalk being placed under the town council, because um, that is really, to me, a real major of safety that are dealt with by um, DPW in the town. Could you please scroll up, Athena? I think that we we actually did discuss that, and uh, it, it seemed like it was an issue that was frequently a resident request, a constituent request, yeah. uh, and that um, I think uh, entered into our decision there. Well, that's really my problem. Um, I, I don't think that the town council as a whole always, we all, we have different neighborhoods, we have different requests. Um, and I was trying to make, keep it from getting into political things. And I figured that if it's a safety matter, which a crosswalk is, that uh, it would be better served, dealt with by the people who deal with road safety, the DPW, and perhaps in conjunction with the police. I'm wanting to avoid the political aspect. Okay, uh, Mandy Jo. Yeah, I, I don't have any questions or comments, but I did wanna correct something regarding the role of GOL in this matter that um, the chair of uh, TSO indicated. GOL's charge um, is to advise the town council on matters of town council policies. It's part of the charge. And so GOL did have a substantive review part of this um, and so any changes they made were substantive in nature were perfectly allowable under the charge that GOL has been given by this council. Thank you. I did not mean any offense. I'll have to say that. <laughs> it's always useful to clarify. Alyssa? So aside from the fact that I wouldn't think that individual town councilors should have anything to do with individual residents asking about crosswalks in that they should be sending those people to DPW. Um, so it should not be political from that standpoint. In the larger sense, the public way is for a reason under the town council. We don't just give away the entire public way because it's convenient for us. And I will give you my favorite example that Guilford despises me bringing up, which is that we would not have a crosswalk from the Jones Library across the street if it had not been for the select board insisting that we were to have one. Because according to various standards that DPW professionals and engineers follow, that crosswalk was not supposed to be there. We were put off for years. Finally, community demand and insistence meant that we got a crosswalk there. I defy people to say that crosswalk shouldn't be there, but had it just been left up to the standards, it would never have existed. George? Yeah, just quickly, I want to endorse uh, Alyssa's point that there is a community aspect here and is where the elected representatives. Um, and I think people sometimes feel that they make requests and they just disappear into a black hole. And maybe some requests should disappear into a black hole, but um, they still nonetheless, I think people need to feel that they've been heard. And so Alyssa's example is a good one, 
where they had to ask and ask and ask and ask and finally the select board was able to do something. So I think that it should stay where it is. Um, I have a comment as a counselor, and that is that when we start getting into the placement of electric charging stations, I'm like going, are, do we really need to be into that level of detail? I, I'm buying the point about sidewalks and so forth, but there's a, a couple things in that list that I'm going, really? That's how we want to spend our time? So I just want to raise that. This is a first reading. We're not voting tonight. Alyssa. Again, reflecting on past practice, when we're talking about electric charging stations, not, not like the ones like so people can plug in their cell phone, but the one for cars, that is important because where it's most convenient place to put it is not necessarily in terms of wiring is not always the best place to put it in terms of like the tone we're trying to set for where charging should be. And so it was a huge effort for staff to figure out where do they put it in the basement of the parking garage? Where do they put it behind town hall? How does that impact the various uses of people who are like to be able to be close to town hall? Because you're not supposed to park in those spaces, even if no cars in there charging, if you don't have an electric car. So giving up those spaces, it's giving up parking spaces for everyone who doesn't charge a car. So that's why it's there. Hope, you know, hopefully it comes up when we get grants and staff always comes up with a cool place to put it, but that's the rationale behind it is that it's giving up other parking by putting it there until of course the majority of us all have cars to plug in. Thank you, I appreciate that historical perspective. On Any other questions on this? Again, it's a first reading. Seeing none, we're going to proceed. Um, the uh, town manager appointment has already taken place. And so we're going on to committee and liaison reports. I didn't miss anything, did I? I assume by now somebody would tell me if I did. Okay. Um, CRC, anything else, Mandy Jo? Uh, no, you pretty much heard it from Chris and Rob today, what we're dealing with tomorrow. Um, we're also still working on the housing policy. Those are the two things that are showing up on our agendas pretty much every meeting. Um, I think uh, President can confirm that we will have, uh, the goal is to have a first look at the draft housing policy at the next council meeting. So we will be talking about that tomorrow um, at CRC um, for hopefully feedback from the councilors um, in about two weeks um, on what is a draft that will not have been voted on at all at, at CRC. It's still in very much in draft mode. That is correct. Uh, elementary school building, Kathy? Uh, yeah, I'll just do a, I didn't do a written report. I think everyone knows because we put it up on the town website and the school put it out, but on February 11th, we were officially invited into the feasibility phase of the project. Um, and what that means as a first uh, critical step is putting out a request for services for an owner's project manager for the project. And we've got a subcommittee that has direct, done a first draft of that. We'll be reviewing it this week and the full committee will meet on March 3rd next week to finalize it. And there are a couple issues that came up, not issues, but just re-looking at it on what goals we're setting for the project, because it also will be determined the scope of work and then how we wait um, when we get responses to our requests for proposals, how we weight those proposals um, as, to cut it down to finalists. So the subcommittee is working on that finalizing the draft and the full committee will meet to finalize this. And then we'll be uh, taking the next steps to hopefully post it and request proposals. Great, thank you. GOL, George. On March 3, we will be reviewing the decarbonization resolution that's sponsored by Councillors Ryan and Dumont. Um, we'll also be taking up a question that a number of members of my committee are interested in discussing, which is uh, wh whether we should have a single policy for um, uh, appointments uh, when we do our reviews. Um, uh, the various council committees have different uh, policies right now in terms of how they do the interviews 
and there's been some discussion about whether it should be a single policy. And so we'll be taking that up. Um, we'll also be receiving um, prior to your meeting a uh, Tibetan day uh, uh, resolution as well. Um, uh, JCPC, Kathy. Uh, JCPC had um, the, I guess, the second of our meetings uh, this uh, in this uh, spring. Are we in the spring or winter semester? And we are meeting weekly. And what we had, and everyone should take a look at it, presented to us uh, last Thursday, and that is available. It is posted. Is a comprehensive look at five years. It's the really first time we've had something to look at. Uh, capital request for all five years, and it does include um, potential debt service payments for the library, uh, for the fire and DPW. So it's starting to incorporate the big projects into that capital plan. The other thing that was included is the beginning of um, an inventory of capital assets that we asked for, and we are um, for the first time seeing sort of a full list of all the vehicles we own, all the buildings we own, all the properties we own with some sense of their value. Um, there was one resident request um, and it's a holdover from last time and it's uh, by high school students for uh, canopies, uh, beginning look at where we can put solar canopies or solar installations around town. So that that is the one request we have coming through the resident piece. But it was a what the staff did, Paul, was just remarkable to pull to pull you and you, including you, to pull together that five year look. We're, and we're now we're going to dive down into department to by department. That's where we go next. Okay. Um Andy, I am coming back to you, not to worry. We'll do both finance and uh, so forth. Uh, TSO, Darcy? Yes, um, TSO is in the process of setting up outreach meetings regarding the Pomeroy intersection project, uh, one of which will probably be incorporated into one of our regular meetings and one on a weekend day in March or April, but we'll finalize that at the next meeting. Um, we reached out to other relevant stakeholder committees to get feedback on the issue of roundabout versus signalized intersection. And on our next agenda on March 25th is the surveillance technology bylaw and the wayfinding signs. We'll also have updates on Pomeroy outreach and on the search for a town facility as permanent housing for homeless residents. Thank you. Andy, um, had a two really packed finance committee meetings since we've met. Yes, uh, there was a brief report that I submitted and is in your packet. And uh, it covered three items that were uh, fairly substantial in over two meetings, the most recent two meetings. In the first one, uh, the first of those two meetings, <clears throat> we reviewed the audit that um, was for the fiscal year 20, the uh, one that was just completed uh, last summer. And uh, we met with Tanya Campbell and that is uh, briefly reported. There's uh, three things in the packet that go with it that you've uh, uh, had an opportunity to see. Uh, the um, audit itself, the general um, audit, for all government activities, uh, a special additional required grant, um, report for federal grants. And uh, I think that what can sometimes be the easiest to follow through is to just look at the PowerPoint presentation that uh, Ms. Campbell used in her presentation. And it highlights the most significant aspects of those two audits and the audit process itself. So that was item one. Item two was that at the beginning of February, um, Finance Director Mangano had sent us a memo and it, it was sort of a good news memo because we could make adjustments to the uh, 
plan that we adopted through the uh, Finance Committee guidelines, which had no increase for um, any of the operating budgets. And because it had been built on assumptions about uh, the state aid, which then um, state aid was more generous as was announced to all of us who were at the MMA meeting um, and some favorable results that we've had in the first two quarters of the current fiscal year. Uh, it was a revised uh, estimate and allowed us to go to one and a half percent increase in each of the areas. And uh, we reviewed those numbers and um, I asked that uh, the uh, PowerPoint that uh, was presented at the Finance Committee be added to the packet for this meeting so that you'd have a chance to see that. And then the uh, most recent meeting was actually a joint meeting with the Council. Many of you were there and it was to receive the uh, presentation from Mr. Mangano about how we could go about funding a mo um, for uh, the uh, for four major projects. And uh, so there was, uh, as I said, good attendance at that. So those were the three items that we have covered in our most recent two meetings. Um, in addition to planning for the committee itself, which I admitted. And just as an aside, the council does not need to approve the audit but later, I believe in April, we will need to approve going out for, with an RFP for audit services. Um, yes, that was an added part. In the, it's actually included briefly in the written report, but it is an uh, action item for the council at a later date. Uh, and I think you have it scheduled for April. I do. Uh, Mandy Jo, you have your hand up. Yes, thank you. I have a question about the um, modified from the town staff uh, guidelines, budget guidelines. Um, they are obviously a change from the council guidelines that we have adopted. So I'm curious whether the finance committee is thinking about asking the council to amend the budget guidelines. I don't know in history whether the select board regularly amended them for slight changes like this or not. Um, but I thought I'd ask to see whether there's a discussion as to whether the council will end up amending its current budget guidelines to reflect the additional information um, that town staff has provided. Um, yeah, we thought about that a little bit, but I think that the uh, basically when you go back to the guidelines themselves, there was um, recognition that there could be changes in projected amounts that become available that was built into the guidelines. And there was also uh, language about what we thought were the most important things that uh, should be considered, at least on the municipal side of the budget, if there were additional funds that came available. And it basically tied back to the goals that we adopted for the town manager for the fiscal year. Uh, they were, um, as you know, um, identical really. And um, so we didn't feel that with the one and a half percent increase that there was really anything more that the council could say that it didn't already say in its prior guidelines. Okay. Uh, Alyssa. Thank you. I wanted to follow up on speaking of, you know, how we used to do things is we've been getting a good amount of input from people who are telling us that we need to consider shifting some money from the municipal side to the school side based on the cuts that they're facing, even at the 1.5% level. And back in the olden days, that was the purpose of the budget coordinating group, that and calendaring. And the budget coordinating group would talk about, okay, is there a way to divide this pie differently rather than saying every area gets 1.5%. And usually, as Andy, I'm sure will attest in great detail, that didn't happen unless there was a bridging type situation for some 
massive change that was occurring in the schools. And right now, although the pandemic is, of course, insane, it's not the same kind of situation. So I'm just wondering, what is it that we're telling people when they say, not looking at which budget they're saying we should be taking money out of, but when they say, it's not reasonable to have this 1.5% be across the board have you considered some sort of shift or some sort of allocation associated with that? How do we direct people with that, those questions beyond just saying, stay tuned for further conversations? Is BCG going to take that up or? Um, Andy, do you want to weigh in? If not, I, I can also respond. Okay. Why don't you go ahead, Lynn? Um, I, Glad you've asked about BCG and whether or not it should meet at this point. And it sounds to me like under the previous circumstances, it would. Uh, and we can go ahead and do that. We have people assigned to BCG. Uh, and um, I do need to get the other boards to assign their people to BCG. Having said that, I'm not clear how that's going to resolve the issue. Um, the, the good news is that with the one point, Five increase that the town manager has directed would e equally go to each department and each unit. Um, it does allow us a little more flexibility in the regional school budget. Uh, Paul, did you want to weigh in on this? Yeah, I mean, I think um, we have a very um, we have a good working relationship where departments understand what they're what they're receiving. The school department is getting more money. It's so they're, but they're making, they have to make cuts because of their prior commitments. So I think it's important to note that, um, you know, they are getting 1.5% increase at the regional school district and at the elementary school level. Um, it, so they're getting more, in short, they're getting as much as more money like everybody else is. Um, but because of the contracted agreements they have with their employees, for the most part, it's mostly people, uh, they have to absorb that somehow. And this is how they've said they're going to absorb that. So when they say it's a million dollars cut or whatever it is, uh, there are pe there are people there and there are jobs being eliminated, but they're not getting less money from the town. I guess the uh, other thing that just for historical perspective, having served on budget coordinating group for a number of years so when I was a member of the old finance committee and um, as a member of the select board, uh, if there was a change um, in the amount of money that became available during the year, we always did start with the presumption that it would be divided equally, but we created a space within the budget coordinating group that if one of the um, major um, areas, which there are four, including schools and regional schools, uh, felt that there was an exceptional uh, situation that they would want considered, uh, that uh, that request could come forward and would be an opportunity for discussion and to see if there was flexibility because ultimately what the budget coordinating group has it was about in that period of time and i think has been envisioned within the charter is a uh, cooperative way of uh, having the four segments of the um, budget, major, major segments of the budget, be able to have that conversation under those circumstances. Uh, and I can think of one example, and it was uh, a request on the town side for a little bit of additional money. And it was agreed to readily by the other, uh, by the schools and by the library. Mm -hmm. Mandy Joe, did you have anything you wanted to weigh in on the charter's present vision of BCG? No. <laughs> okay. right. That's that's fine. Um, let me uh, consult with the town manager, and we'll see whether or not we move forward. BCG is advisory to the town manager, um, so it's um, not 
a rulemaking body, it's advisory. Okay, George. I just feel compelled. I mean, I have my concerns about the school budget. I've expressed them in other contexts, but I do feel it is an extraordinary year for our schools, um, as we all know. They're going to go a year without face-to-face -face instruction. So I do have a concern about how well positioned the schools are for when the students return in the fall, because it looks that's likely what it's going to be in terms of the fact that they're going to be behind, there are going to be all kinds of issues, emotional, psychological, educational. So I wonder if that isn't something that BCG uh, might consider. I think this is an extraordinary situation um, that, that needs to be taken into consideration. Um, are the schools, do they need more resources because of this extraordinary event where they have not seen students face to face for over a year? Are there any other questions or comments at this time? All right, then uh, we're going to go on to uh, the town manager's report. And I'll mention specifically that, um, I'm sorry, go ahead, Paul. Okay, so thank you. So um, first off, I do want to note that the, the audit was a very good audit uh, and it was nice to hear from an outside voice that uh, the town's finances are very strong, the reserves are, 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 are good and um, extraordinary in some ways. And so it was good to hear an objective um, voice to confirm what we felt we were doing. Um, on the um, COVID, uh, the university had their um, um, increase, a cluster on steroids as it were, um, two weeks ago. Uh, they have they in, they took immediate action and locked down the campus for two weeks. That opened up as of today slightly, and um, the town, for its part, and, and the reason they did that is they had uh, started to see a downturn in some of the cases. There's still a lot of cases coming through. Uh, today's not a good day to judge because it comes from the weekend. So we'll look at the numbers tomorrow um, from test results today that happened. Um, the town did not move forward on their on our um, expanding the um, seating capacity of restaurants and the later closing time for restaurants. Um, and yesterday, uh, the town of Hadley Board of Health did open that up a little bit more. We're going to, again, look at the um, numbers that come through. We'll consult with the state epidemiologist to see their take their read on things that are looking at the numbers as closely as we are. So we, we're going to continue to look at the data and let that drive our decision making. Um, the um, vaccination, um, we did a tremendous job of vaccination. The state told us we the standard for getting rid of vaccine into people's arms, if you get a supply is about 85%. We're in the 97 to 98% range, which puts us in good stead with the state. Much credit to our team, you know, um, health director, fire chief, assistant fire chief, facilities people, everybody who jumped in uh, to make that happen. Um, we're hopeful that and have made, a, especially with our state legislators who've been very strong on this, made a very compelling argument that there needs to be, a, there needs to be vaccination sites in Hampshire County. Uh, we have talked with the State uh, Board of Health about sharing a, a, a regional site with the City of Northampton, with the City of Northampton being the lead. Um, we, they were receptive to our request. They have not told us anything yes or no on that at this point in time. We're anxious to get a, a confirmed answer um, to that. If that were to be a yes, we would be able to reopen our vaccine clinics for anybody 65 and older, plus all the other categories that are permitted by the state. Um, we are prepared to do that if they give us notice and they deliver the vaccine that we are um, able to deliver. Um, so both the city of Northampton and I met with the mayor and with health director there and with our health director and we're all on board. We submitted our application. Uh, we're hoping that they'll be receptive to that. Um, I think the next three to four months are going to be particularly challenging for the um, for the council. You have a lot on your plate. You have a lot of hard decisions to make. Um, and we're here to give you the information you need to make these decisions. Uh, I mean, everything from financing to zoning to capital projects, just, just a lot coming down the road. Um, really proud of our work last week on the, um, on the four, four capital projects and on the capital plan. I mean, the 
Credit goes to our finance team led by Sean Mangano, um, just putting together stuff in really high level. Um, really welcome the feedback from JCPC on how we can make that product better. So it was the first cut at it, really good feedback on what was working, what wasn't working, and we'll take that apart and put it back together after we go through um, all the information after the departments present to JCPC. Um, but feels um, uh, really good to be moving forward on some of these these projects. Um, the so we've been doing a lot of outreach um, this Thursday. Uh, we're, there's a million outreach opportunities. Last Friday we were we had a very large turnout for our cup of Joe when Sean was on there talking about uh, the capital pro the four capital projects. Um, 20 people, which is unusual for, for a virtual thing like that, showed up. A lot of people had comments and came in and talked to us. Um, the Thursday prior to that, we talked about the uh, North Amherst Library. This Thursday, the library director and a couple of and one of the trustees and um, Ken Farber will be on the community chat at noon. Um, so again, trying to do as many things as we can in this uh, virtual world to connect with, with folks. I'm also holding off and off office hours. So if people want to talk one-on-one -on, -one on any issues that they want, open to that. Um, we continue to meet with the university uh, uh, town gown meetings every Thursday. Uh, the president is there, representatives from the town. And the last couple of meetings, we've had representatives from the State Department of Public Health um, there as well to help us talk through some of the data that is being shared and the decisions that the university is facing. Um, the um, you know the, the new um, we'll be talking about the uh, I know the TSO has added the permanent shelter for the homelessness to their council to their meeting on uh, at their next meeting which is really a good thing. Um, the farmers market will be submitting its proposal to they would like to utilize the town common again just like they did last year probably with some minor modifications. They're willing to. Um, uh, sort of not relocate, but if there's a major event, thinking about the, the uh, Rotary Fair, they would just not hold the farmer's market that day. We are not really sure at this moment in time whether we're going to be able to allow anything happening on the common this year. Most of the things that happen, we can probably adjust around uh, the um, farmer's market, but they were very pleased and it worked out well for us. If, as long as there's uh, aren't many conflicts on you and requesting uses of the common, but that will be coming to you at your next meeting, I believe we scheduled that for the eighth, at least for your first review of it. Um, so, but it'll look pretty much what like it, what it looked like last year um, along those lines. So the question came up about uh, the funds, the eighty thousand dollars for community uh, um, safety working group. The community safety working group has been working and they're becoming more focused, uh, I think, in their last last few meetings. Um, they did put an in invitation for bid out. The bids were open today. There were three proposals. I don't have the details on them. They have to be reviewed to see if they uh, meet the requirements. Um, and these three bids, if, if they meet the requirements, then you have to take the low bid. And so um, there was a, a pretty broad range of what those um, numbers were and there's some variations that they can put together. So I think they will be looking at that on Wednesday. Um, the, those funds, you know, I know there was the request from the reparations and you heard people talk about that as well. Um, and that's not off the table, but what, I'm, what, I, what I was trying to convey and maybe I didn't explain it well, was that um, the first order of business was to support this group that has been working to make sure that they have the tools that they need to complete their work. And I think you're going to see they're they're struggling. With, they're not struggling. They're they're working really hard, but trying to get to where we need to get to in order for me to make some proposals to the council for in the budget this year. Um, so I'll leave it at that because they're, they're still working progress progress with them. It looks like a lot of people have questions. So open that up to that. Dorothy. Okay, I have a comment and a question. Uh, my comment is that my daughter was able to get an appointment for Bob in Worcester. So we're going on Wednesday. Um, I'm really looking forward to getting it back to town. People will be very happy when you do that. Then I have a, a Rip Van Winkle question. Uh, it's about the Station Road Bridge replacement. Um, are you talking about a permanent replacement now? 
Yes. Because, you know, when we voted for the temporary one, I thought that the, 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 the discussion was about this temporary one's going to could last 20 years. We don't need to do it right away. So um, I guess I'm a little surprised that with it, not even three years where the temporary, the permanent one is coming in. Was that because of some uh, unusual grant that came our way that we had to go for? It was, a, I think it was the last year of the small bridge program as it was moving forward. Mm -hmm. And so we put in for it. We don't get, and so that's, you know, and we, we got it. Um, and you're right. My anticipation was that, that the temporary bridge could last for quite some time. Um, but ultimately we're going to have to replace that bridge in a permanent way. Yeah. Can you, and that, you can, that, but that will have to come back to the council as well. I'm sorry. Uh, can you reuse the temporary bridge? In other words, some discussion of that. Yes, you can. Okay. Well, okay. But good. Good. That will, that will have to come back to the council for two front. One is to borrow money and also because it's a public way. Okay. Good. Thank you. George. Paul, in a previous report, you had mentioned that Rob Mora was looking at the rental registration bylaw with an eye towards uh, uh, revising it. And I don't know if that, I, he's obviously got a lot on his plate, but I wonder if there's any uh, development there or if I can reach out through you to him to learn more about what might be happening in, in that area. Yeah, I, I can check with him. I think that the zoning, they, I mean, I, I really appreciate that the council recognized the work that the planning department did. They were on fire, excited about working on this. It was, the, and they, it was, it was, there was the whole team working together. So it was, it was really exciting to see them just, you could hear them, um, you know, talking through everything constantly. So you really inspired them. So I appreciate that you recognize that. Um, I think they really are focused on the zoning. The rental registration is up there, but I think that's fallen to the side. But um, I'll check with him on that for you, George. You, you sure they weren't cursing us, Paul? No. no. That was positive. Okay. Yes. All right. I take your word for it. Darcy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just have a quick COVID question. Um, I heard today that the, the Northampton Board of Health, um, there were vaccinations happening there. And I, if, did I understand you to say that we might join with them? And if so, would we be going to Northampton? Oh, good, really good question. Um, so what they're giving out are just doses that they already have. So we're doing first vaccinations on Thursday this week. We're doing vaccinations all this week. It's mostly second doses for people that we have. And then we, last Thursday, we remember all those doses got hung up in Memphis and we didn't get our doses. So everybody who's scheduled last Thursday, we moved to this Thursday. Um, so all those folks are in a, and if they had, um, I think everybody's, filled in their slots, so we have no slots available. Um, but if we were to, if we get grants, uh, some um, vaccine from the state as a, as part as a partnership with Northampton, we would hold it, we would conduct the vaccination clinics here, most likely at the Bang Center in sort of small three or four hour um, increments. Uh, so, because it's easier for us to manage at the Bang Center and we can do it, spread it over time and it, it's, it's smaller crowds and there's a lot of advantages to that. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, two quick questions. Um, they both relate to the community safety working group. The first is you mentioned in your report that you might be seeking another extension for when they need to report or when you need to report to us. Um, the goal of our dates was so that you'd have enough time to get something into your budget. So my question is, even with an extension that you're anticipating asking for, is that going to still be possible? Because that's a concern, at least of mine, is to be able to figure out whatever they recommend, how do we fit it into the budget? Um, and the second one is the, I guess it's the reparations for Amherst request and all. Um, I don't know whether this is part of the legal opinion you're gonna be asking for, but I have this vague memory that I've been told in the past that towns can't just give money to nonprofits or people without things like bids or projects or stuff. So how does their request fit into any legal restrictions like that? And do we need to get a opinion on how that could be done if indeed we do want to do something like that? Yeah. Great questions. So um, yes, there will be something in the budget if the, if the 
and they know what my budget deadline is, the, the community safety working group, it's, and there's, that's immutable, I have to deliver something to you. Um, and I would want their advice on it, but something's gotta be put in that budget for FY22. Um, you're right that there is the anti-aid amendment where you just can't vote to give money to a, an organization um, because you like them or whatever wonderful um, thing they're doing. Um, what we would say is, and I would actually look for guidance from the council on this, if we were going to walk down the reparations route, is that something the council really wants to embrace and what does that mean? I think the um, proponents have actually articulated some very fine um, um, questions that I've posed to the town attorney um, in terms of ways to meet the needs um, through uh, and what kind of entity could be could qualify for those needs. So I think it's, it's something that we have to dig into and, and very clearly it's something that not many communities, I think just a one or two other communities in the country have done this. So I think we have to do it very carefully. Um, and, but that's for the whole repar and if we, if that's the whole reparation thing. That's just one tool of lots of different tools that we need to bring to the table. So. Continuing with that thread, um, two things. One, I want to acknowledge the work of the Community Safety Working Group. They're doing tremendous, very important, deep work. And I'm really uh, happy to see that uh, we do have three proposals from consultants who would be working with them because, yeah, we really do need um, they really do need that support and uh, we should be offering any kind of support we can give to them. So that's great. The second is um, we have an amazing opportunity right now to work with Alderman Simmons, who's willing to work with, uh, with us specifically holding two, um, two closed room meetings, closed door meetings with the black community and and the idea would be that last time when we passed the resolution for reparations and we heard very clearly and we all agree that this initiative needs to be led by the black community. And what, Sim, uh, what um, Alderman Simmons is willing to do, she's like a leading expert on municipal reparations. What she's willing to do is work with the black community and figure out from their perspective, what does reparations really look like for Amherst? And you know, what, what do they want? Who is it going to help? Who is it going to work for? What is that going to look like? So I think that's very important work that needs to happen. And we cannot expect, ask for anyone better to lead that in a safe space for the black community. And so I think that's something, and we have specific numbers for that. And, to clarify, the money is not going to the reparations for Amherst Group. It's going to go directly to um, um, Alderman Simmons, and she's willing to do this work uh, on a volunteering basis. But I do believe we should be paying her for for her services, and the money would go directly to her, either as an honorarium or you know whatever her fees is. We have very specific numbers now that we can share with you. And uh, the second thing is, yes, we do need to figure out a process moving forward. Um, how do we decide who to give to money and who, who do we give the money and, uh, you know, and what that process will look like. But meanwhile, I don't want us to lose on that opportunity. It's not a very big sum of money. And I don't want us to lose that opportunity where we have a consultant, a very, um, you know, um, an awesome opportunity. So that's okay. uh, Kathy. In my comment, Paul, um, is on a completely different topic. And it's on something you didn't mention in your report. Um, we're, I think at the next council meeting, we're due to see the North Commons uh, potential design discussion or soon. And I someone shared to me the excellent community survey that Evan put together. It was a monkey, a survey monkey, which said, here's a plan A and a plan B. What do you like about them? What do you do? You know, kind of, and I'm wondering if we could get the plan. We had 
a discussion that narrowed it down to two potential options and some discussion on what happens to Boltwood, but we haven't gotten the one revised one back. And if we wanted to do it at a district level, just to get some feedback from residents, I mean, Evan did it in a nice way that just took the existing one and described it in a slightly different way than the picture. But I think it would be a good tool for others of us to use to get it in advance if we could do this simple. Um, and I thank you, Evan. I thought it was extremely well done. And two residents mentioned it to me, which is why I even knew about it. Um, getting some feedback from people um, about the potential design of that project. So we're missing the one. Mm -hmm. Okay, I hear you. Uh, the North Common is also on the agenda 48. Yeah, and that's what I thought you told me, Lynn. So I thought if we need it sooner rather than later, if we're going to do put out something like this, and I don't know how much feedback we'll get, but it was a nice way of getting it out earlier um, before we face uh, talking about it again. So that would be a requirement then that the packet for the council would come out early. Um, and I'll talk with Paul about how fast you think that can happen. Yeah, and it's, you know, they just, and I was just said that it was described well enough that Evan could easily, you know, do his choose A or B. We just didn't have a picture that showed A. And so I don't, you know, it's not that the whole, so Lynn, you can work it out. And it's just like, we're missing one picture. Um, I, I mean, we just have to be careful about what material we put out. Sure. For one purpose, it has to be the material that will then come to the council. Oh, yeah. No, I wouldn't want it to be not what we were planning on looking at. Absolutely. That's, that's a matter of when we can get the pack, the whatever is going to be in our packet for March 8th, how fast we can get that. And I'll talk with Paul about that. Thank you. Andy. Yeah, just quick follow up on Shalini's question. Um, to hire anyone, including uh, and specifically thinking about the person that's being proposed from Evanston, don't we have to comply with uh, state procurement law? Yes, yes, we uh, yes we do, and um, especially um, so. Like the council, if you're buying something, a service or a training for yourselves, that's one thing. If, you, if it's for a public purpose. Um, this one gets into an area where we're hiring, a tri it, it sounds like a, a, what they're described was a, a meeting with people. Um, is it, how is it aligned with the town's policies and whether, what public purpose is it for that? So it just, I, yeah. Steve? I don't want to break up the flow. I want to go back to something else. Yeah, I, I see uh, mm -hmm. Councillor Baumill probably wanted to say something. Can I yield to? Yes, uh, Shalini. Appreciate that, Steve. Just a clarification, Paul. Are you saying that uh, if for in this particular case with Alderman Simmons, we would need to go through the, wait, what is needed exactly? What do we need to move forward? Because I thought if it's less than 10,000, we don't need to go through the public process. You have to follow a process, uh, but you have to use sound business uh -huh. decisions. So, you know, you, you need to so say what you want. You go out and you get people who can respond to that. And then if they meet the thresholds that you establish, then you negotiate, you do your sound business process. Um, you, usually low bid is the, is, the, is the logical thing to do. Um, so. Okay, you can, I mean, I guess you can tell us after, but it would be helpful to have specific criteria what is needed to move this piece forward and what is needed to come up with the process in the future. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Steve. Yeah, so uh, I'm sorry, this is kind of a slightly different topic, but so we've talked about the Pomeroy intersection. We've talked about the North Common um, just briefly tonight. But I just really the the comment was this that they're both public way projects. So the Pomeroy intersection, there's some description of stakeholders or something like that. So obviously the stakeholders are the people whose property might be taken. But this is a public way project that affects the town. 
So we should think of this in the same way that we're thinking of the North Common, that when we're talking about stakeholders, we're talking about anyone in the town that's interested in it, not just people that live within a certain range of that. So it's not like a, the parties of interest are a butters or a butters to a butters. It's a public way, many of us use it, whether or not we live in that part of town. So we're all comfortable talking about the North Common that way, like everyone, because everyone's from Lund, but the Pomeroy intersection also is very much part of the fabric of the town and should be any kind of um, outreach that's done for that should involve mm. the entire town. Agreed. Any other comments? Right, then uh, moving on to the last part of the agenda, uh, I uh, did send out a, pre a monthly president's report and also um, the updated ongoing agenda items. Are there any questions at this point? Mm -hmm. Dorothy? Um, yes, I don't see broadband mentioned. And I know I've brought it up at a number of meetings and I'm seeing articles about it, um, you know, back from the town I lived in Norfolk, Connecticut. Uh, it's getting in the newspaper more and more frequently. So I really do hope that at some point we can have a chance to talk about broadband, municipal broadband. Okay. Are there any other future agenda items that people want to mention? All right, then um, on the future agenda items, Pat and Shalini, do you want to update us on the train? Pat, do you want me to do it? Are you doing it? I thought you were doing it. Yes, I'm happy to do it. <laughs> For sure. So uh, the good news is uh, we have um, we have a trainer within a budget and our schedule, and we've sent out ev to everyone a doodle poll. Hope I mean Athena has sent out a doodle poll. Hopefully, um, everyone had a chance to look at that. The good news is that the trainer we have was one of the core trainers that in the work undoing racism workshop that Pat and I attended. And um, we had an amazing transformative experience as we've already shared. Um, so this is Annie Rodriguez and from Equity Consulting Network. And she has been doing this work for 10 years. And she's, uh, we've spoken to reference, we're speaking to references right now. We've got excellent uh, recommendations for her. Um, she is, I don't know what, I mean, it's within the budget that we were hoping for and it's fitting our schedule and um, I'm happy to share more. And we, we'll be sending a packet along with the bios and their experiences, the recommendations, references and all of that. Is there anything else you'd like to know, Lynn or counselors? Um, nope, I think that that's, um, Fine. Is there anything else? Any other uh, counselor comments? Alyssa? So I'm left in a slightly confused place about the reparations request. So I understood all the words that, that have been said so far, but originally we were asking about a process for various groups to be able to access the 80,000. I understand what Paul has said about not having any idea if maybe some of those uh, response to the bids are gonna come in at 75,000 and that's going to use up most of the money. But what I don't understand is given that we initially had in fact started asking the questions about what would be possible in terms of what kind of organization would we be able to give town money through, would there be a town fund? Would it be a private fund, et cetera? Would it look more like CDBG? Would it look more like something else? And, and as he says, this is a very unusual thing to do. What, what is also true is that years ago, even when the anti-aid amendment existed, we had contracts with social service agencies where town meeting directly gave them money. And it was supposed to be a contractual relationship, but it was not a contractual relationship where we went out and did a request for a bid to say, who can do the job Big Brothers Big Sisters does? That wasn't a thing. So 
I'm not convinced that this is too hard and that we can't do this. So I would like to hear some assurance that we have a future agenda item that this is not just something Alyssa's interested in and Shalini's interested in, but it's something that the town council talked about in broad terms when we created the resolution. And are we push, just pushing the can down the road and saying, well, we'll talk about it when it comes to the FY22 budget, given the timing of Alderman Simmons and this very unique situation. I, I'm struggling with the idea that it's too hard to figure this out. And I, I'm wondering how we get over that hump. Mm. Paul, do you have any further comment you'd like to make? Mm -hmm. No, I mean, I mean, it, it, if it's something the council wants to talk more about, it, it could be added to your agenda, obviously. Yeah. Mandy Joe. Question on the training, a couple of questions. I mean, I filled out the survey, but um, it didn't have times for the days, you know, it just said the days. And so that was one thing that made it hard. Um, the morning afternoon without times made it hard too. And, and I was very concerned that two of the weekends provided were Passover and Easter weekends, um, you know, that of things. Um, so I, I tried to fill it out. I don't think I was very helpful when I filled it out. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think next time if we need another survey, it would be very helpful to at least include what time of day we're looking at on each of these days um, and half days and things like that. I know it said morning or afternoon. And you may not know, but I do no, know. know looking at 8 a.m. to 2 or 9 to 7, you know, like... And, it was hard to answer questions that way, just, just a comment. We're looking at nine to five on the two days, either a Friday, Saturday, or a Saturday, Sunday, depending on which dates are selected, and a three hour follow up uh, about two to three weeks afterwards. The, I will tell you now that based on the poll of most, the date that includes the most number of people is of April 10th and 11th, which is the week after Easter. And I do think this is something that all the counselors need to attend. So um, I'll just put that out there. Oh, can I just add one more thing, sorry, about the training is that uh, we, uh, we have the flex, I mean, there is a, framework which is very rigorous and robust and there's going to be an emphasis also on how to practically apply the training into our work but we also would encourage once we decide and confirm that we can send our questions because that's the whole idea is that we have a safe space to address some of the questions, not there's no guarantee that those specific questions will be answered indeed. But I think this is also an opportunity for all of us, places where we've all struggled at different points to, and so we could we would have an opportunity to send our questions ahead of time. So we will be going around and collecting those and sending it to the facilitators. Are there any other questions, comments? Pat, you still have your hand up. Yeah. Um, Building on what Alyssa said, when we passed the resolution, we talked about um, investigating, implementing, um, issue, uh, how to um, eliminate systemic res uh, racism in Amherst. And we talked about the community, engaging the community in that process. I forget the exact words. I have them written somewhere. Um, oh, and so to me, the idea, we, number one, we need a process. And uh, while I have a tremendous respect for the Community Safety Working Group, and if all the money gets used for their work, I will not be unhappy. But at the same time, we didn't put the money there just for that. So we need to really look at what will 
engage the community. Um, and, and we really do need a process. And this is something that council needs to come together on deciding what, what our, why did we sign that resolution? And what is it that we see going forward? Yeah, and, and others, let me um, think about how we, what question we would pose and how we bring this to the council as a, an agenda item, because I'm hearing it as being unresolved. I'm hearing it as not being quite clear financially, but also then what is it we're really asking for in the guidelines? Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other Thank you. That. I'm hearing it as a future agenda item, is what I'm hearing. Yes. I'm just not quite sure how to frame it. Okay. And also, the immediate thing is the hiring um, uh, Alderman Simmons for that. Are those two separate? I, I see them as two separate things. One is a future process, and one is right now we want to keep that momentum going while she's available because we know we struggled hell of a lot to get trainings trainer for us because it looks like the whole country is doing this work right now. And so we don't want to lose that opportunity to have Alderman Simmons work with the black community. So those are two separate things. All right. We'll talk with Paul about that and see what we can come up with. Okay. Thank you. Are there any further comments? Questions? If not, the meeting is adjourned at 1040. <laughs>